The day is finally here, and history will be made. Taking it to the next level, live from Edmonton, Alberta. Welcome to FE 2018 Canada, the first annual Flat Earth International Conference Canada 2018. Featuring Rob Skeeper, Patricia Steer, Mark Sargent, Bob Nodell, Darren Campanella, Matt Long, Emmanuel Laconga, Robbie Davidson. And your master of ceremonies, Rick Hummer. Please give a warm welcome to the founder and organizer of FE 2018 Canada, Robbie Davidson. Wow, here we are again. I mean, this is exciting because I was able to bring the first Flat Earth International Conference to the USA last year in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it was exciting. The first ever making history. But what's really special in these next two days is this is history for Canada. And what makes it really amazing for me is this is my home city. So it's very special to bring it to Edmonton, Alberta. It's amazing that so many people are looking at these two words, and it brings up so many incredible emotions, whether it's anger, whether it's sadness, whether it's despair, all of these incredible emotions, and people are wondering what is going on. How in the world, in 2018, can so many people be questioning something as simple as the Earth, or are questioning mainstream science? And while it's exciting that so much is happening, and that people are truly searching for the truth, there's also a sadness, there's a painful aspect to what's happening, especially with this community. I've been involved for three years, and I can say that there's a lot of excitement, but it comes at a cost. And people have endured a lot of hardship. Many are suffering in silence. There's a lot of stuff going on that honestly, it's time, and I'm gonna be the first one to really start seriously addressing it and saying, look, we're a community, we're asking questions, it's time to stop the ridicule. It's time to stop the name calling. It's time to stop the threats. And what makes this incredible for me today is I can talk about a lot of painful stories. And while I'm not gonna be mentioning any names, the only names I'm gonna be mentioning is me and my family. And while I have had an amazing success, I have been sitting on what my family has gone through in the last three years here in Edmonton, Alberta. And I knew there would be a right time and a place. I knew for me personally, that God would let me know that this is the time. Because it couldn't be out of anger, and it couldn't at all, I couldn't make this personal. It had to be based on principle. So I want to share a bit of the journey of what me and my family have gone through. And I'm going to hold certain people to account. Not that I'm angry, it's just time to seriously address different abuses, different things that are happening. So while this is going to be a different message normally, it's important and it's the time. So I'm going to basically explain it to you all. When it came to this topic, Flat Earth, it was an incredible experience. In many of my interviews, I've explained the entire journey. But at the time, we were going to a church not very far from here, a few blocks, called Grace Life Church. It was a great church. We were, we were there. We were seeing this as a great opportunity to raise our family, we had wonderful friends, we got even close with the pastor and his wife. And what made it so amazing was I could talk to this pastor, he loved questioning things. Now, we never really got into this topic because I wasn't even there myself, but questioning the Federal Reserve or the monetary system, and he was kind of one of those guys. So I'm like, this is cool because I've always been one of those type of people. So I felt safe, it felt good. So when I came to it, I started 
talking to him slowly, saying, wow, you know, like, and looking into NASA and the moon landings. And it got to a point where he started bringing it up with his family. You know, his children were like, hmm, that's a good point. I wonder if they landed on the moon or not, and different things. And what was really incredible was it was just going along with the flow. Nothing, nothing was out of the ordinary. We were carrying along. But then all of a sudden, things started arising. People started knowing that my YouTube channel, Celebrate Truth. People started talking. All of a sudden, we found out that there were individual Bible studies going on where the topic was being brought up, and some people were for it. Some people were incredibly against it, and some people were trying to keep the neutral ground. Hey, hey let's keep peace here. Like, it can't be this bad. It was incredible. But to me, the most startling thing in my tw over 20 years of being a Christian, I had a call from the pastor one night, and he told me, I just want to let you know that it's going to come to a point, not now, but eventually, at some point, we are going to come to you. And we're going to give you an ultimatum. What's the ultimatum? It's either this church or your YouTube channel. I said, dude, you have to be kidding me. I was utterly shocked. That's, the, that's an understatement. Of course, talking to my wife, it was a painful thing. We had got to know many, many people. We loved everything. And all of a sudden, we're held to an ultimatum. Even though the church was looking the literal interpretation of the Bible, six-day literal creationists and all that, which was bizarre because even while I was sitting there saying, show me from the Bible, you know, where I'm wrong, they still couldn't. But it was interesting to me just how all of this started transpiring. So obviously, I talked over with my wife and I said, listen, this is just a learning lesson. There's no way I mean, we're going to be in a church that tells me at some point we're going to be like, is it going to be next week? Is it going to be next year? When's it coming? It's coming, but when's it coming? We can't live like that. But I wasn't angry. I was like, it's a good learning lesson. It's sad, but let's find a church that at least, you know, is safe. And I knew that I wanted to make sure that my family was in a safe environment. So under some recommendations, we found a church here in Edmonton as well, Fellowship Baptist. And what was really interesting that my wife read on their bylaws on the website was they had a clause in here. Because in Grace Life Church, they got to a point where it was incredibly strict, incredibly restrictive. Where it's like, you know, we need to give you permission to have a Bible study. Or we need to know this, or we need to know that. So, okay, some people like that. I didn't. But I'm going to find a church that's a little bit more free. So, on the website, it said, religious liberty. We believe in religious liberty. That every man has the right to practice and propagate his beliefs. Sounds good. So, I knew that my first meeting with Pastor Jason Hagen... It would, be interesting. it would be important to just lay it out. Just say who I was, YouTube channel, review it, give me the good, the bad, the ugly. I just want to know. He was familiar with the channel, watched my documentaries. Everything was fine. Great. The second meeting brought my wife. Wonderful meeting. We talked about it. Cool. We don't have to look over our back. Yeah, a lot of people at our church, while we might agree to disagree and stuff, it's not really essential to being a Christian, you know, these different topics, especially when it came to the earth. I mean, what does it matter if it's round or flat or you know you hear this all the time and it's an important thing because a lot of people will dismiss it as what does it matter who cares but you're going to find out really quickly that people really care about this topic um so i'm like this this is wonderful great so all of a sudden i said well listen he said to me he goes you know i don't agree with it right I'm like yeah but he goes it's all good it's all good I, I don't agree with a lot of people in my church but we have like religious liberty awesome i know your clause says hey you allow your personal beliefs to believe different things as long as it's not a central doctrine like you know you don't believe in jesus well how do you be a christian at that point makes sense so i'm like okay great so we had a couple meetings and we were kind of doing some bible studies and i'm like yeah show me i'm going to show you what i'm getting from these bible verses and you show me and well into about two little studies with him i realized that he didn't really take anything in the Bible literal. He looked at it as all allegory and poetry. And while there were people in the church that definitely believed it was literal, it was like anything goes. But it was all fine. Well, the third meeting was interesting because when I arrived, it wasn't just him. There was another gentleman sitting there. And I'm like, oh, this is different. I didn't know there was going to be two of them. And of course, I sat down. Now, I'm not going to go into the entire discussion, but let me say it got incredibly heated. It went on for over an hour. But near the end of it, it actually something kind of transpired. And it was like, okay, things are okay. There were three qualifications that they wanted, and we made an agreement. One was that I wouldn't just look down on people that don't believe in this, like they're lesser than. And I said, am I doing that? Well, no, we're just saying we don't want you to do that. I'm like, okay, I agree. The second thing was, we don't want you to mix in the fact saying, you can't be a Christian without believing this. Yeah, I don't believe in that anyways. You know, this is, this is not salvational. I'll agree. 
The third one was, when you come out with a documentary, all we're asking is, can we just give you some suggestions? And again, their suggestions had nothing to do with the content. It was all like, maybe your language is a little strong there, saying all, or you know what I mean? I said, sure. You know, I'm not saying I'm going to agree with it, but I'll, I'll let you, you know, look at something that I'm going to release as my next documentary. Great. So we had an agreement. I was excited. Things were moving ahead. We were going to find somewhere that, while well, they didn't believe in it, they were cool because, you know, a lot of people had their differences. So everything was great. Until one Sunday, we're there. A lady came up to my wife and said, yeah, I noticed, you know, you're in the nursery, you're doing this and stuff. We need a lot of help in the nursery to help with the babies. My wife was just amazing with babies. You know, would you mind helping? So my wife came to me and said, well, you know, what do you think? I said, that's a beautiful thing. You know, help out and, you know, you're amazing with babies and stuff. Awesome. Let's do this. So the next week she came back and she's like, oh, I'm sorry. She's like, what? I was told you're not allowed to help with the babies. At that point, I knew exactly what was coming. And I said to my wife, I said, I want you to email Pastor Jason Hagen. And you say, Bobby, why would I refuse to help babies in a nursery? So, because me, I knew what was coming already. And, and, and this is maybe the most comical part of it. What's she going to do? Whisper to babies, the birth isn't a ball. They can't comprehend anything. What's the threat? It was ridiculous. But sure enough, exactly what it was. And we got a big word, like letter back that basically your allegiance with your husband, we don't agree with it, you have no right, I mean, you're welcome to come, but you basically will never become a member, we will never give you any type of activities here, and all of this. So, again, it was a really, really painful period. Number one, my wife's coming to me with tears in her eyes, that she can't help the babies in this church, while we were just at the point where, like, okay, we found somewhere. So, my big point on this is, when people say, this is no big deal, or people just laugh it off, it's not a laughing matter because people are hurting. There's people losing their jobs. There's people that are threatened. There are so many stories I could tell. And I'm not trying to have a downer here because, again, we're going to turn this thing right around. There is hope. And what's really exciting is we found a third church. And it was True Life Baptist Church. And it, the most amazing thing to me is while they don't agree, they're here today to learn they have been supportive from day one, and that's all I'm asking for. I'm not saying I need everyone to believe the way I do. But again, this is the conversations we need to have people with people. Is we can agree, we can disagree, let's talk, let's just talk. So to me, you know, I want to say a big thanks to Pastor Jackson and his family for just, you know, embracing us, but also being supportive and also being here and helping out and just wanting to kind of learn. And I know, for one, that, you know, in their journeys and looking into this, he's already been saying, you know, I'm pretty much certain we're geocentric now. So we're moving that direction. But even if he doesn't believe in it, the fact is that my family and I are safe because they realize on the scale of one to three, you know, how does that impact who we are as people? And, you know, it's a beautiful thing, right? So, again, anybody, you know, that's here, whether you're a believer whether you're a skeptic, whether you think this is a laughing joke, in the next two days, there's going to be something here for you. One thing that maybe makes you think a little bit different, question something. And again, that's all we're asking is just ask those questions. Look into it a little bit more. You might be surprised at what you find. So it's an exciting time. Like I said, the first international Flat Earth Conference in Canada. We have a spectacular two days that are set. You're going to see some incredible presentations, amazing panels, some really amazing surprises. And it's just an incredible, incredible opportunity. And I'm so thankful, like I said, to have all of you here uh, making history in Canada and be able to do this at Edmonton, Alberta. And like while I'm sitting there saying that we've suffered pain in this city, there's going to be a lot of victory as well in the city. And I know that. And I'm excited about it as well. So I guess in, in closing, I just want to sit there and say that Anybody that's listening to this, the bottom line is this. Don't, don't blindly just trust somebody. Go do your own research. And before you dismiss something, start looking into it. And that's really the biggest message I would send to the media or anyone that's covering this. It's important. And you're going to get to a point where you can only laugh so long. Understand that you might be laughing at the expense of people. And again, this doesn't go on with any other community. Nobody would get away with this. So for me, one, I'm going to start standing up. I'm going to basically be holding 
different people and organizations just like those two churches. I'm going to be holding them to account. And Fellowship Baptist, I want them to at least amend their bylaws saying, we believe in religious liberty and your right to practice anything except two. This was interesting. I said, if I give up flat earth, what about geocentrism? Nope. So let me get this straight. You can believe anything in this church except those two? They're like, yeah. So I'm saying to Fellowship Baptist, you change it where you can believe in anything here except geocentrism and flat earth. So that's my charge when it comes to this. And also, hopefully the media will get their response why they are basically shoving people out of their churches over an issue that they don't even take the time to address. And what's discouraging to me is one of the pastors, even just two weeks ago, was up laughing about flat earth because supposedly he was down in the States and kind of met an astronaut, so he's got to put his cheap shots in. I'm just saying, come to the table. If you're so confident to sit on stage and laugh at us, and yet you want to address it biblically, this is where I'm at. But again, I'm a religious person. I'm a Christian. This community represents non-religious people as well. There are people that don't believe in the Bible or non-religious. I'm just countering my story. But there's people suffering not to do with the church, to do with many areas. Their jobs, their vocations, their family. And so many people are like, I haven't told my family yet. I'm worried. And it's time to start standing up and just... Just say it. Just say it. Whether or not. I mean, Rob Skiba, for one, for the longest time, was just going out and saying, I'm just looking into it. I'm not even a flat earther. And he was getting railed on. Maybe just start there. But that should tell you something. When you're saying, I, I, I'm not. I just want to look into it. And you're still getting railed. Something's going on. When people do not want you even questioning this, something is going on. So, like I said, we've got an amazing two days. It's exciting for me uh, to bring all of this uh, to you. It's going to be an enjoyable two days. And with that, I'm going to say that uh, a really true good friend of mine I want to introduce, and he has done so much for Flat Earth, not just behind the scenes, but also right in front, whether he's on a boat on Lake Michigan with Rob Skiba debunking meteorologists that are, what you're seeing here is a mirage, <laughs> or doing experiments with FE Core. Rick Hummer has done an incredible, incredible things. And for me, I just want to say that he's intelligent, he's very funny, he's got a heart of gold. And welcome to FE 2018 Canada, your master of ceremonies, Rick Hummer. Thanks, Robbie. Well, uh... Welcome, everybody. Hi. How are you? It's flat, eh? It's flat, eh? Uh, should I stand behind the podium? I keep moving around. Um, first of all, I just want to say, uh, last year at the Raleigh conference, Rob Skiba mentioned a date and said this was the day that Mark Sargent ruined his life. Um, all I can say is within 48 hours after that happened to Rob, Rob ruined mine. Thanks, man. Love you, mean it. Um, but no, once I started looking into this, and I had to take it from a, a perspective of, I worked in the media. I did radio all over the United States. Uh, I traveled, uh, lived in Norway shortly. Um, just did a bunch of different things. Um, it helped to be voted the best class clown when I graduated, to take this with a grain of salt and pretend it was sugar. Because really what happened was, at first, I thought, what does this mean? I didn't laugh. Rob, did I laugh when you said it to me? Did I laugh? No. A lot of people laughed at it at first. I learned my lesson by looking at some of the things that I was told by the media that I worked in. Things that I had to actually repeat. And for anybody that has ever worked in radio, anybody worked in the media before, or radio, or TV, or anything like that? You get a news feed, don't you? The news feed isn't coming from your building. It's coming from somewhere else that your, your company, your station, pays for that service. And you don't go off that page because there's a reason why they call it radio and television programming. There's a reason why they call it programming. It's the same reason that textbooks are picked by a curriculum director. They have school boards that vote. And I, I suggest, I highly suggest any of you parents out there that have students or, or children in a public school, you better find out who that curriculum director is 
And you better pay attention to who the school board members are. And if I were you, I'd get them out of the schools. Because they're not learning the truth. And the sad thing is, a lot of the stuff that the kids are learning, they're learning it from other kids. So I'm not going to rag on public school completely because there are some good ones out there and there are people in the public school systems that are doing their job the best that they can. But literally, the dominoes are stacked up on them as well. And there are flat earthers in the, in the public school system. But like Robbie said, if you open your mouth, you're done. You better find another job. So that kind of happened to me. I, I, I'm not going to go into that long spiel. Uh, if you want to know about that. There's a reason why I don't have a YouTube channel for years. What I did was I was always after ratings. That's how I got my bonus checks. You want to shoot for being number one in the market. Go into that market, conquer it, become number one, get your bonus check and look for the bigger market, look for the bigger paycheck and go. And, and figure out a way to get in the minds of the people and, and know who your audience is and go and go and go. Once again, it's programming. I didn't realize that I was programmed to go after that dream, go after that chase, that, that pride. And I think that's what the biggest hurdle is that most people have with Flat Earth in general, is pride. Because they don't want to admit that they've been programmed. So what is the real test? The real test is, do you have a love for the truth no matter how salty it may be? Because it's easy to swallow cotton candy. It dissolves in your mouth. But pour a bunch of salt in your mouth and try and swallow it. It's tough. But one of the things I've also learned is if you get cut, if you're, if you're telling the truth, say that your tongue is, is like a sword. And when you tell the truth, it cuts. Well, if you, if you go and try and sugarcoat it, go, go and get an open wound and pour sugar in it. What's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to get an infection. You're going to, it's going to rot, right? But if you pour salt on it, even though it hurts, it's going to help in the long run. So be the salt. Tell the truth. Chase it down. Make it happen. But use your gifts. Use what, use what you've been given. And be kind to people. Be loving. Be nurturing. Because I can tell you this. None of you woke up to this by accident. There's no way. There's no way that everybody in here is here that doesn't know each other. And some of you that are together, look around the room. There's faces you may have never seen before, but there's a commonality and a common denominator. And that is, you're willing to learn. And that's God-given. Because it's real easy to stay in that programmed mind. It's real easy to stay in that, that comfortable pride that everything's cool, we got this, we know. I know. It's really hard to admit that you've been lied to or you've been duped. It really is. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes to think, yeah, I was the butt of the joke. <laughs> awesome. Chalk it up. But what it really comes down to is, do I really want to know? Do I really want to know what the truth is? Do you guys? Yeah. Give yourselves a hand. It's the truth. Yeah, raise your young clap. Because that's what it's really about. It's about literally looking at it for what it is and being able to accept it. And one of the things, you know, Robbie touched base on this, you know, with the church. I had it happen to me in the media. And it wasn't even flat earth. Oh, my gosh, I can only imagine what would have happened to me in 2004. You know? I was, uh, where's the uh, McLean brothers? Where are they at? The Canadian boys. There they are. We were outside a little bit ago talking. And, uh. One of the things I said was, you know, it's like, think about if you could go back in time, you as yourself. So here's, here's Rick Hummer right now in Canada. And somebody says, hey, you got to go back 15 years ago and go find the old you. And you need to go tell the old you that you're going to be here right now <laughs> at a Flat Earth conference. <laughs> what would you say? And it's and you know, you know, the 15-year-ago you is looking at the now you going, that is me. Could you imagine what the 15-year-ago you would be thinking looking at the 15-year now you? How many of you would have ran and tried to hide so that the, 
the, the you from 15 years ahead wouldn't find you again. Because 15 years ago, I would not have even thought about entertaining this at all. No way. No way. I was just getting into some other things. Federal Reserve, some of the hijinks of just, let's just say the geopolitical chess game, the nonsense that goes on. I can tell you this, no one in Congress in the United States is ever going to be at my house for a backyard barbecue. I know this. I know that most people in Washington, D.C. are never going to know who I am. I know there's probably some that do, because I believe that there are certain people just in this room. The way that they've got the system set up, we can be monitored. They can do anything they want. So be it. But let it be known, there's a lot of people in this room that are not afraid of you. At all. Because we broke the programming. And we didn't do it on our own. I believe it's God-given. I truly believe it's God-given. I believe there's a movement by the Almighty, and His hand is all over this. Because things are being revealed in the last days. So if you think I'm crazy for saying that, you obviously haven't read some pages. And you haven't been on your knees asking and going straight to the source. Because that's how deep it goes. But at the same time, even though we're all here, some of you may not understand some of this. Some of you are just here to, like Robbie said, just to observe. Wonderful. But one thing that I can say is I'm going to lighten it up here a little bit. Me being the class clown growing up, a lot of the things that I used to do as a kid growing up, I had it pretty rough in, in certain aspects, from family life to some other things. And the way that I hid my pain was by making people laugh because it shielded the pain. So for whatever reason, that resonated with me. And I was able to say, you know what? This is actually more fun making people laugh. And in programming, if you can actually make somebody laugh, they remember it. When an emotional string is, is plucked, basically what happens is if you're in the middle of learning something, if it's something that really hurts, you're going to remember it. If it's something that makes you laugh and it's joyful, you're going to remember it. But which one's more fun to remember, the fun one or the painful one? What if you could take the painful and make it fun? So I started thinking about this. And Rob and I, Rob Skiba and I, were working on, we were working on seed together. Actually, I was helping him. Because this guy is a, ma a maniac machine when it comes to this project. But I had this other character that I used to do years ago that I developed with a friend of mine to basically help out at a racetrack when things were slow. But I didn't want people to know it was me. So we came up with a character, and as it, as it developed, it was there for a while, and then all of a sudden, Flat Earth came into the picture of my life. Thanks, Rob. And so I took this character, and I said, I can use this character to bring Flat Earth onto the scene to an, a whole group of people that may not ever entertain learning about the true identity of creation. So, with that being kind of a deep thing to say, I want to share something with you guys because there are some people out there that think that I'm, um, you know, they think that I'm uh, just kind of here. But there's some things I've been working on pretty hardcore, and I've been getting the help from a lot of the people that are in this room. And I thank them for that. And I, I am truly appreciative of that. So, one of the things I learned is if you have talent, and someone's been, you know, not using their talent. I believe they're wasting it because I think we all have a gift. Just got to find it. So I want to share something with you on a project that I've been working on. And just so some of you know, I worked in LA for a long time. I used to do storyboards for some productions. I was in a couple movies that never made it to Blockbuster. Thank God. <laughs> they weren't those kind of movies. They were great movies. They were funny. But what I can say is I've been working on something on my own, on my own time. I have a wife and two children. By the way, I just want to say thank you to my lovely wife, Tabitha, for being patient with me and being patient with my friends and my brothers and sisters in this community because if my phone rings, I try and answer it. And I try and get back to people. 
But I want to lighten the mood here for a minute, and I want to share something. The fries are up. I know that sound. But I want to share something with you. There's a project I've been working on. And how many of you have heard of a name Roland Reddy? Probably none of you. Good. Well, here you'll get to meet him. So let's go ahead. If we can run that, I want to share something with everybody. And I'll explain it real quick because I've only got a minute 23 if this is done. Ever heard of a stunt guy named Roland Reddy? Of course not. But he's on a mission. All right. It's not done yet. Don't clap. You haven't seen the whole thing. I'm just kidding. So how many of you know the guy that was in there? Neil deGrasse Tyson. How many of you can't stand the guy? Stop right there. I'm going to tell you right now, he had no idea who I was. He happened to be doing a show in South Bend, Indiana. And I knew he was going to come in through the back door because I used to do radio in that town. I used to MC a lot of concerts. And so I knew that he was going to show up. I just happened to call that day and say, is there any way I can get an interview? They're like, no, he's not even going to get here until 530. <laughs> oh, okay. Call my buddy. Get the camera. I got an idea. We're going to get this guy. So it was planned for us to meet up with Neil. But I flat out asked him, can we, can we have a conversation with you for this production? Absolutely. I've only got a little bit of time. He heard it himself. And he did it. But what I can tell you is, I feel sorry for Neil deGrasse Tyson. I feel sorry for these guys that are locked into the programming, that are ignoring the science that's been tested and proven. It's not a ball. The formula they gave you, eight inches times the mileage squared, does not work. It's observable. Test it. Observe. Test it. Observe. Collect the data. I don't know about you guys, man. When I start adding up numbers, I get tired of adding up the same numbers that don't work for a formula that we've been given as a programming device that when you realize it's not round at all, it's flat. Flat. Water's a natural level, right? Yes. Is water a natural level? Yes. Okay. How many of you flew here? Anybody? Anybody fly here? Everybody drove? All right. Next time you're in a plane, look out. Try and see the curve. It's not there. But most importantly, do the tests. And one last thing, because I've got to bring somebody up here that's, that was crucial in everything that, you know, Flat Earth means to me, um, that just love the guy. Love the guy to pieces. But one of the things I will say is that when you run into somebody that has not heard of this or doesn't know, don't be mean to them. Be the salt. Just tell the truth. You can candy coat it if you want. As much as they want to ridicule and scoff and mock, there's a big movement in the United States. I don't know about here, but there's an anti-bullying thing that goes around, right? Have you heard of this? The bullies? The media's all about it. So why do they do it to us? Why? Why aren't these journalists actually going, hey, let's go on, hey, can we go on this test with you? Instead we get, I want to call it dung. 
for mainstream programming. How many of you, how many of you watched the Mythbusters being busted? Because I can tell you in my own market, where I'm from, I'm from South Bend, Indiana. And there's a guy there, we all heard it. What you're seeing here is a mirage. What you're seeing here is a mirage. Mirage. Okay. Got an idea. Let's go take a boat across the water and keep Chicago in sight the whole time. Sooner or later, that mirage is going to have to figure out where reality is, right? <laughs> Tested and proven. It's not a mirage. So now what? Balloons go up in the air. It's flat. Where's the media? Where's the outcry from the media? Trace the money. Trace the programming. It comes from the top. And the guy that's been used, the guy I truly believe that God Almighty has used to break the programming for so many that put it in such a wonderful, tangible, almost edible source of information. You can take a bite out of it, chew it up, and swallow it. And guess what? It's not salty. It's not sweet. It's perfect. And the way that he put it was perfect. And I'm very thankful for this guy right here. And welcome to the stage, your first speaker, Mr. Mark Sargent. Am I okay? Does this pick up? I'll do this just in case. Some months ago, a German television team contacted me because they had heard about my science challenge and had found a physicist at Georgetown University I could debate. They also wanted to make it as easy on the scientist as possible, so their idea was simple. They would record me on video, reading five quick science-based questions, and then send that recording over to Georgetown, and he would respond in kind. This is what I read on camera. One, long distance photography. The mainstream science formula for the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared. An easy comparison would be the falling rate of 32 feet per second per second. So eight inches per mile per mile. Two miles is two times two equals four times eight inches or 32. Three miles is three times three equals nine times eight or 72 and so on. At 50 miles, the curvature is 50 times 50 times eight, coming in at over 1,600 feet of curvature. And yet, with HD cameras, we can pull boats back into frame that are well beyond visual range. Not only does the new technology clearly show that it's not a mirage, but the same objects can be viewed in infrared and can be targeted ship to ship by beam radar. Can science explain this? They had no answer. Number two. Vacuum versus gravity. The force of a vacuum is measured in units of tor, T-O-R-R. -R. Even a low-level vacuum can overcome gravity here on the surface. In building molecule-free chambers for the manufacturing of electronics, a series of massive pumps are needed to create a 99% vacuum. That's negative nine tor. And for the remaining 1%, horsepower isn't enough. It can only be achieved by a chemical leaching process. That being said, how is the negative 10 tor vacuum force of space not ripping off the atmosphere of this world? What is gravity? Oh, we're going to do both. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and remember that there are gases that already defy it, like helium, hydrogen, and fluorocarbons. Isn't it more logical to suggest that the atmosphere is being contained in an enclosed pressurized system? They had no answer. Number three, eclipse shadow. Mainstream science tells us that the moon is over 2,000 miles wide, and yet during the 2017 American eclipse, no offense, the moon's shadow was only 70 miles wide, a reduction of over 97%. This is what the equivalent of having a six-foot man walking in front of a wall where his shadow is smaller than an action figure at only two inches. Where do we see this in our everyday lives? We've seen a shadow's actual size and some much larger. Where can we see small shadows? The Flat Earth community says that the moon is less than 50 miles wide, much closer and the same size as the sun. Isn't this explanation also possible? They had no answer. 
Number four, moon temperature. Science has yet to address this relatively new discovery that the moon generates a cold light. We all know that in the daytime it is 90 degrees in the sunlight, 80 degrees in the shade, depending on conditions. I know I'm, I'm not going to do the Celsius conversion up here, sorry. Uh, however, at night, especially when the moon is high in the sky, we see the opposite. While it might be 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's warmer at 60 degrees in the moon's shade, sometimes showing temperature shifts of over 13 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition, under controlled experiment conditions, magnified moonlight is even colder still, again, the opposite of sunlight. We can generate this with technology today using a cold laser. The question is, why is the moon giving off a cold laser light? They had no answer. Last but not least, the Van Allen belts. A simple yes or no question. Are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? If yes, then how did Apollo 11 through 17 make round trips through these belts with only aluminum and plastic as shielding? No one died, no one got radiation poisoning, nobody even got cancer. I think there's still like five left. Radiation is only stopped by two metals, lead and gold. Both are very heavy and cannot be used in aerospace because of their weight. If the answer is no, the belts are not deadly, then explain the video currently on the NASA.gov website called Orion Trial by Fire, in which NASA clearly states the belts are so dangerous they will not be testing manned capsules because they are unable to solve the radiation problem. Keep in mind, this is not an old video. It was created at the end of 2014. The scientist viewed my recording and folded like a card table. This piece was never aired. All that being said, my name is Mark Kendall Sargent, and I'm a flat earther. <laughs> flat earth is my passion, it is my obsession, and it is now my life. I watched my very first flat earth video in the summer of 2014. Like many of you, I quietly laughed at it, and then I made a huge mistake. I casually thought I could debunk it, <laughs> then realized it wasn't so easy. I rolled up my sleeves and tried to shut it down for nine months, and then I failed. Confused, irritated, and mildly depressed, I then published my very first Flat Earth video on February 10, 2015, with my full name, address, and phone number, prepared for the ridicule that would inevitably follow. The video, called Flat Earth Clues, simply stated what I saw and prompted people to do their own research and ask questions. The phone rang almost immediately. A person on the other, the, on the other end of the phone said, tell me more. Then another call came, and another, and then the emails and the texts. I couldn't tell what the attraction was, but for whatever reason, it was resonating, so I kept generating content. Fast forward to this morning. I've done... 80 videos dedicated to answering emails, 84 Flat Earth and Other Hot Potato shows with Patricia Steer, 159 weekly Strange World shows, over 1,200 Flat Earth videos in total. Since my phone number was very easy to find, I received calls for interviews, and I did everything I could to accommodate them no matter who they were. I've talked to everyone from junior high newspapers to major networks, and I do my best to treat them all the same. I set my feet, keep my cool, and do whatever I can to plant the seed in their head. If they, want into lay, if they want to lay into me, I smile. If they give me an opening, I create momentum. I try to kill them with kindness, honey over vinegar. And if they give me enough time, my message will get into their head. Look into flat earth, do your own research, ask questions. And yes, seeds were planted. Every video that I made, every interview that I sat for was viewed by people who talked to other people and eventually it circled back around. I honestly thought the first one was a fluke. I was in Atlanta, Georgia, sitting in the audience as Zen Garcia was engaged in a theological flat earth debate, because that's a thing now. We took a break for lunch and I went over to the closest restaurant I could find, a sports bar in the same parking lot. The bartender, a woman in her late 20s, overheard us talking in the corner. She came over and asked me directly if we were into Flat Earth. I said yes, and she said, high five. <laughs> the next day I flew out from Atlanta. My carry-on was going through a second screening. 
and I was wearing a I am Mark Sargent t-shirt. A young Homeland Security man pointed at my bag and then me. He then kept staring at my shirt and my eyes. Back and forth he did this until finally he asked quietly, Yo, you Mark Sargent for reals? <laughs> I said yes. He winked at me, handed, my, handed me my bag without opening it, and said, that's my name too. <laughs> he knew the Fight Club reference. We may not all be Mark Sargent, but we are all flat earth. I was at a recent salt and sea test in Southern California, and after an exhausting morning with skeptics, National Geographic, and a whole bunch of flat earthers, we met up at an organic cafe in Palm Springs. The cashier, who eventually figured out what we were doing at our tables, then showed us the anything but secret hand sign. <laughs> you see, she was one of us. Despite what you may hear, we do have people everywhere. That same trip, I was out to dinner with a few people from the meetup. Patricia Steer received an invitation for drinks at the weekend home of a Hollywood icon. We went, along with Rob Skiba, and found out that the Flat Earth grapevine reached much further than publicly reported. When I got back to Whidbey Island, that's in Washington, by the way, if you guys didn't know, I walked past a construction crew. A young man was staring at me from a distance and then approached. He asked me if I was that guy from Flat Earth. Keep in mind, this is a rural island in the corner of the United States. That very evening, and I cannot make this up, my cousin called me from Manhattan. She was there in a wine bar with executives from one of the biggest Wall Street hedge funds in the world. One of them brought up Flat Earth. She mentioned my name. And not only did they know the clues, they insisted on sending me a picture of them next to a phone with an AE map on it. Only one other person in this room has seen that picture. My point, and I'm repeating myself for the documentary team who did not believe me, is that we have people everywhere. At first, I thought Flat Earth was like the Spice Girls, who, even though they sold 80 million albums, almost no one was willing to admit that they owned it. The truth about Flat Earth is that we're much bigger than the Spice Girls. Currently, the majority of our membership is in the closet. For every one of you here, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, with the same information and the same awakening. Think that's an exaggeration for the media that's here? A recent article inside Russia said that at least 3%, and these are the ones that admitted it, of Russians believe in the flat earth. If that low ball number is true, that's over 4 million people, 4 million flat earthers just in Russia. They stand quietly and watch from the outside, waiting for the moment when mainstream makes it something to talk about without ridicule. For the community members who are on the front lines, and there's a bunch of them here, taking the hits day after day, I salute all of you. Just look at the amazing work these people have done in just three years. D. Marble got on an airplane with a spirit level, and he made national news. His channel now grows every day. Nathan Thompson has the largest Flat Earth Facebook group in the country. Patricia Steer has put herself out there on camera doing over 250 Flat Earth and other hot potato shows. Globebusters averages over 1,000 live viewers in a hangout, something that many globalist YouTube channels would be envious of. Celebrate Truth, who I have heard is Canadian, is at 98,000 subscribers. Oh, and in his spare time, he organizes first-of-its-kind conventions like this. Jaronism has grown to over 113,000 subs. Rob Skiba is 145,000. Controversy 7, another Canadian, is at 151,000. ODD Reality is at 185,000. And there are many, many more. Too many, in fact, to mention here. Keep in mind that these aren't video game or makeup or food channels. Like Sparta, this is Flat Earth. All of these channels and this massive wall of content has affected almost everyone else in the social media. In the last year, the ripples from our members have spilled over into the YouTube titans. And they have responded, some positive, some negative, but the exposure is priceless and the numbers staggering. Star Talk, one video, 2.3 million views. This morning in UK, one video, 2.8 million. Jimmy Kimmel, 3.7 million. Rich Ferguson, 4.4 million. Joe Rogan, 5 million. PewDiePie, 
the largest YouTube channel in the world, did not one but two Flat Earth videos at six million hits each. Space Videos, which is a dedicated 24-7 science live stream, now has to put debunk Flat Earth in their title. And it does nothing but create more awareness for Flat Earth. Thank you for that. Niga Haiga generated 15 million hits in one Flat Earth video in April of last year. And Shane Dawson generated 15 million Flat Earth hits, and he did it June of this year. I remember in the fall of 2015 and how cool it was that Forbes magazine even mentioned the words Flat Earth in an article. Now if I don't see a news story every other day, I feel let down. That's how media spoiled we've become. In fact, it was one of these recent articles by U.gov, a British media research company, that got the attention of National Geographic. You see, they had polled over 8,200 Americans and asked them about the shape of the Earth. And the number that stood out, the 18 to 24-year-olds. Over a third of them were skeptical of the official story that we lived in a spinning rock flying through empty, meaningless space. That study was the first wake-up call for science, who up until now has just dismissed the people involved because our numbers didn't present a threat. Now, at least some of them know differently. And for the rest of the scientific community, I come bearing a message. I like science. I always have. I flew here on the back of science. And I am speaking to you now on the fruits of its labor. Science, however, was never intended to be a religion. And that's what you've turned it into. You've turned it into scientism. You've taken the faith that people have in your lab coats and you've turned it against them, pushing concepts and products onto the population which can be harmful or just simply untrue. You've taken what should have been simple observations and twisted them to suit your needs and make us feel small. We're not small and we're not an accident. In fact, we are the new scientists and we're heading straight for you. You don't want to defend yourself? Fine. Any ground you're not currently standing on? It's ours. We'll take the cities, we'll take the suburbs, we'll take the countryside. We've already been winning this war by attrition because you didn't think we were worth it. You want to call us a social media virus? Well, at least you got one thing right. We are infectious. We're currently the most interesting concept in the world. We're easy to understand and we open minds. Oh, and one more thing. As you sit there in your offices, wringing your hands because you don't want to risk that vaulted education of yours, we've been running around your flanks at speed for the last three years. In closing, I'd like to circle back around. My name is Mark Kendall Sargent, and I'm a flat earther. Every day, I try to set an example for the community. I make content, I do interviews, I fly to meetups, I place stickers, I leave bookmarks. My car has a license plate that says it's flat. Even my gaming guild is named Flat Earth. When I'm awake, I'm trying to figure out new ways to plant the seed, and I absolutely will not stop until Flat Earth has changed this world for the better, because that's what we all deserve, a better world. <laughs> Long live Flat Earth. Thank you. All right, um, Mark Sargent. Yes. You and your crazy flat earth clues, pal. Hey, uh, what we're gonna do real quick, uh, we're already going over, imagine that happening at a conference. Real quick, uh, to get you guys all involved, first and foremost, would you guys rather have a 15 minute break now or a 10 minute break now? Because we're gonna end up shaving some time off either on the lunch break, or we can do it now, but we're gonna try and keep everything on track because last year we kind of got a little behind. But we're not gonna do that this time. We're gonna, we're gonna figure it out. So would you guys speak up? Would you rather have a 10 minute coffee break or 15? 10 minutes? All right, do me a favor, stand up real quick. And if you haven't met everybody, just kind of say hey to everybody. This is a great time to be here and we just wanna say thanks. So get up, stretch your legs, introduce yourself. And Mark's Q&A will be back right after this. Check, check. All right. All right. If uh, anybody by the door, if you guys could holler out real quick and tell those guys we're going to.
start rallying in. Welcome to the first Flat Earth Rodeo. Lasso them in. Bring them in. There's still people getting coffee back there. We're not going to rush them. Take a drink of the coffee, and then you'll be quicker getting back to your table. Are you guys Are you guys ready? There's still people out there. All right, we're going to give you guys 60 seconds. By the way, I just want to uh, I want to say again, thank you for being here. Um, and what a beautiful city Edmonton is. And uh, what a ridiculous-sized mall. Wow. Yesterday we went shopping, and somebody said, go down to the food court. Is there more than one food court here? Okay. That's probably why we got lost coming out of the first one. But all I can say is you guys have a wonderful mall, wonderful facility. Uh, and I think it's kind of funny that we're all at Fantasyland. And then, of course, the theme park is called Galaxy Land. And the media made fun of us. Okay. I just think it's very fitting. Uh, I also want to say a special thanks to a guy here that uh, made the trip from Indiana as well, Kentucky. Uh, lives right on the, the border of Indiana and Kentucky. Uh, if you guys don't mind, give a, a round of applause for Jake Grant. He's running around with a, with a camera from Now You See TV. So, Jake, wherever you are, I saw you floating around here a little bit ago. I want to say thanks to you, brother, for making this trip and being a part of this and helping out. And he's helping out with the Rolling Ready Project as well. Guys, we're going to, if you guys can be real quiet back there, we're going to bring Mark back up, and you guys can just make your ways back. We want to try and stay on time. So thank you. Uh, once again, everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, we hope that you have a, uh, a very uh, enjoyable time at this conference. Uh, thanks again to Robbie Davidson and his wonderful family for being so gracious to uh, many of us and for having us be a part of this. Uh, this is not something that any of us had planned um, as far as getting to know each other. But I can tell you, I do not believe in accidents. I do not believe in just random acts of whatever. Uh, I do believe this is all have, has a purpose. And once again, the man that brought me into this, you know, after Rob ruining my life, Let's go to the uh, Q&A with Mr. Mark Sargent. You need this. What? You need this. You don't need that. You need um, that your mic. Yeah, but this isn't working. Does it doesn't turn you into a person. I'm going to be like the guy when the professional tennis players aren't playing. They have the, the kid that's holding the umbrella. No. no. Well, no. No, I just want to make sure. Is this, is this picking up? This right here? Is it okay? All right, uh, we did this down. <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, we did this down in uh, Raleigh when we did the conference down in the United States last year, and it worked out really, really well. Um, just want to preface it with that flat Earth and, and this conference isn't about me. It isn't about the speakers. It's about you. You guys make up the, the mass of the, the membership. You and the millions of others that couldn't make it here for whatever reason. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, I, I could talk to you all day about all sorts of stuff, but I really want to talk to you. And so this is a Q&A session. So what we've got going here is we have a microphone right over there next to the lovely Patricia Spear, who I can barely see because of the light. And we also have a microphone back right in front of us with those other lights over there. And just what I, what I encourage anyone to do is if you have a question, because I will not be able to talk to everyone here that wants to talk to me. I would love to use them. Whatever you've got, I don't care if it's pro, against, I don't care if it's media asking a, an obvious question, I don't care if you're asking me my favorite flavor of ice cream. I just love it. Chocolate marshmallow ripple, by the way. That, uh, via my address, it's on all my videos. Uh, so please, by all means, and while we're waiting for people to go to whatever microphones, oh, I'm sorry, there's a little incentive. Anyone that asks a question will automatically get a customized uh, Flat Earth Illuminati card right here. 
signed by me. This particular series is called The Sleeper. I kind of took off, you know, I love movie references, anyone that follows my stuff. Uh, this is from Dune, the 1984 movie, The Sleeper Has Awakened. All of you have awakened. That's why you're here. And when you leave here, you're going to be talking to other people, and eventually they will be awakened as well. And so, yeah, all you have to do is, you know, when you ask a question, you'll get handed a card like this, and I, I signed it on the back. I had one guy down at Raleigh who, who came. I, I, I'll, I'll tell the story real quick. He, because um, I signed him, I signed him in advance. And what happened was he came up to me afterwards and he goes, "Hey, can you autograph this?" And I thought I'd play it up. So I said, "Okay, hold hold the card like this, just like this, in front of you." He goes, "Okay, okay." And I go, "Wow!" And he looked and he was just in the, the autograph was there. And so, but I, I let him in on it. So, do we have a question over there? Yes, we do. And uh, by the way, uh, yeah. stay, just, it, you don't have to give us your full name or anything, but name and where you're from. Yeah, sure. To... All right. I'm Ryan from Sherwood Park. Cool. Um, I'm curious what your take is on Mad Mike Hughes. Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay. He's a friend of a friend of mine. And oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've all got our opinions. I'm just curious what yours is. Now, it's pretty fascinating. Okay. No, no, it's no <laughs> problem. I, and by the way, you can ask me about any person that's in the community. I won't yeah. give you all the deep dish, even though I've got it, all of it. Uh, oh. But I, I will, I'll, I have opinion on just about everybody. So, Mad Mike Hughes. Okay, so down in the States, you guys didn't know, he's known as the Rocket Man, the, the Rocket Stunt Man. Actually, he's a, he's a lesser version of Roland Reddy. And he, what he did was, he came to us, the, the Flyers community, and he wanted to do this rocket, kind of like an evil Knievel. If you're old enough to remember the evil Knievel jump over the gorge in, I think it was 1976 or something like that. And he asked us for to help finish the, the rocket in terms of funding, and we did. And, we, and for that, we got this giant flat earth thing sent over on the side. And it, w it worked out really, really well because uh, we got a huge amount of exposure. We had three waves of media. That part was a little dicey because he didn't launch twice, sort of a cliffhanger thing. So he, 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 goes, to, you know, he goes to launch. Nope, nope, technical problem. So he leaves, comes back several weeks later. He's going to launch. Nope, nope, technical problem. Finally comes back the third time and launches, but the media down in the United States just, just jumped all over it. They really, really loved it. So on one hand, yes, uh, the exposure was fantastic. Uh, is there a little friction between him and some of the members of the community? Yes, because he was kind of late to the game, and, and it was beneficial for both of us. But in the end, it helped. I mean, he, the, the headlines, you can look them up even now. Uh, normally, it would pop this up on the screen, but that's okay. All you have to do is go to your phones and type in Mad Mike Hughes or Mad Mike Rocket Band, and his stories will be in there until the internet crashes and burns. So, cool. All right. Get your card. Yeah, yeah. Your thanks a lot. I got the card. All right. <laughs> right on that. Uh, and, uh, by the way, I cannot see that. If there's anyone over next to that microphone. Yes, I do. Okay, good. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Peter from Lethbridge, Alberta. Right on. Could you tell me something about the arguments put forth for the atmosphere supposedly moving with the Earth? Atmosphere moving with the Earth. What I try to tell people there, and it was kind of kind of worked into the, one of the science questions was, um, and I I wasn't into this for a while, which was the the vacuum power. I've talked to engineers and pilots and air traffic controllers and you name all the branches of the military uh, down in the United States and some outside of the United States. But when I got into guys that specialized in two two guys in particular, one guy was an industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals. And the other guy was a vacuum expert. And this will this kind of cut to the chase of your question, which is what basically they were saying was is that the vacuum, if you believe in space, the power of a vacuum is way, way, way too strong to keep wispy gases. Gravity, if you believe in gravity, cannot, cannot even compete with, with what's happening out, outside of this world, if, again, if you believe in mainstream science. So when anyone talks about, oh, you know, is the atmosphere going with the Earth or against the Earth? Is gravity holding it down? I go straight to the vacuum of space, and I say, Go forget about that. I go, there's no reason the atmosphere, sh atmosphere should be here at all. It, the only way it works is if it's some sort of pressurized enclosed system, like a shallow sports stadium. Does that help? Yes, he sat down. Okay, yes. cool. All right. Oh, you already sat down? Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. That's excellent. Uh, j let's, we'll go over to... Actually, we'll do Patricia. Patricia again. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lori from Edmonton. Clo closer to the microphone. I'm from Edmonton. My name's Lori. Hey. And just one question about um, we see the North Star at yeah. night, and we see time-lapse photography of stars moving about us. 
Right. So that all makes sense for us. Yeah. It's also doing it at the alleged South Pole. Right. Where there's about six stars. Right. How do we perceive that one? The, now, and of course, you know, I can't speak for all the, the people that are going to be, you know, we, as you know, the flyers community is divided on, on a number of issues. We can all agree it's absolutely not a globe and everyone's got their own thing. But with me, when it comes to that, uh, I treat it no different than a planetarium. I'm a, I'm a little bit older. If you, I don't know if you guys have planetariums up here where, you know, it's basically just a sports stadium with all the seats removed, all the seats are laying on their backs and you're, and you're projecting the stars in the screen. Uh, but what happens is, if that particular planetarium was large enough, you'd have to have multiple projection systems. And the argument I, I try to throw there, and this is kind of going to what you're saying, is that let's say you've got, you're on one side of the planetarium and your friend is on the other side, right? And you're, or you're, you're talking to each other on cell phones, and you're miles and miles and miles apart. You say, hey, I can see the belt of Orion. Your friend says, I can see the belt of Orion too. And you say, well, the blue star in that is, uh, the middle star is blue. And he says, no, the middle star is red. Who's right? Well, technically you're both right because they're probably looking at what you think is identical, but no, they're just separate belts of Orion. They're based on based on region. That's how you would do it. That's how I would do it anyway. Does that help? Makes sense. Thank okay. you. Cool. You over there. We've got David from uh, Edmonton. I got a question. Yeah. Is there any like rich people or like um, famous people that believe in flat Earth? And the other part is like. Is there anybody like trying to like break out to the very edge of flat Earth, like some sort of expedition? Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. I can't go into too much detail on on this because, with as you know, as, as you get more money and prestige and power, you also have more to lose. And so, what you know, the, the public ones we we know about. The first one that came out really was um, a musical artist named uh, Bob. He was a he was a rapper in the United States. Um, and then who's the Tila Tila you know, did did her thing, and then Kyrie Irving was was really really big, uh, but but remember Kyrie Irving had almost nothing to lose. He had just won his world championship. He was playing with LeBron James, one of the most recognizable faces in sports, and he was only 24. So he was like, what do I care? Yeah, Earth is flat. I have talked to other people. Yes, to answer your question, yes, there are a whole bunch of famous people that are that are into this, but they have a lot to lose. They're not going to come out until they know the media won't crucify them. Uh, the, the story, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate just a little bit on this, was when I was, Rob and Trisha and I, we were at this particular Hollywood person's place, and he, um, and, and he asked us, he goes, well, don't you want to know how I found about it? How about it? It's like, well, you know, because we're talking about different circles. And I said, yes. And he said, I heard about it at the Oscars this year. He was at an Oscar party, and that's what they were talking about when they were drinking champagne. You'd think they'd be talking about awards and stuff. No, no, no. They were talking about stuff, and the, pe the, the person that introduced him to it is, a, is an A-lister as well. And he said the same, I'll tell you then, he said that there are a lot of people in high-ranking positions. And uh, that thing I mentioned, I know I probably glossed over it pretty quickly, um, one of the Wall Street hedge fund guys, the CEO of a massive hedge fund uh, in the United States, uh, I can't even show that picture to anybody because it would actually affect the stock price of what he's tied to because, you know, right now. Now, if he comes out later, you know, oh, he'd be, he'll be in the clear, but he can't, he can't talk about it now. He, you know, he, so uh, there's a lot of flat earthers that know, you know, certain people, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with one more. Sorry, one more thing because we got time. Um, I went to shoot uh, some, some footage down in Los Angeles with uh, uh, part of Shane Dawson's team. He's a big internet guy. And we had an actor show up at the set who's on a major television show in, in CBS. And, you know, we talked and, you know, we made introductions, but he made himself very, very clear because, you know, he was only in his second season. By, by the time we got to the end, he shook my hand. He goes, I was never here. <laughs> it's like, okay. So, yes, lots, lots of people. Do you have somebody over there? Yes, my name is Phil McDavid, yeah. direct relation to the captain of the Oilers here in Edmonton. Cool. My brother Elliot had a question for me on top of the mountain the other day in Hudson OPC. It was a clear starry night, we were standing there having a beer, and he says, tell me something, Mr. Flat Earther. He says, why isn't it we can't see the fucking moon tonight? And I didn't have an answer for him. I said, and it was two nights straight, we could not see the moon anywhere. Uh, 
I, that's a tough one for me to answer because I get those emails and phone calls all the time. People will say the moon doesn't look right. Uh, you know, the, the phase is wrong or it's not there or how can this be, you know, it, or it's a daylight scenario. Uh, what I try to tell them is I, for whatever reason, I think the pro whatever the, the projection system here is, either they're leaving, leaving us breadcrumbs crumbs deliberately or it's out of sync sometimes depending on, on region. I just don't know more than that. But, but yeah, I, do I believe it's real sometimes? Oh yeah, anytime anybody sends me that, I never say, oh, this guy's full of it. I immediately say, yeah, yeah, could be. Good enough. Yeah. Uh, yes, you. Hi, I'm Chris Cardillo, I'm a medical doctor. I believe the earth is flat. Um, just wanted to uh, ask about the moon. Um, yeah. Sometimes various astronomical societies have said that they've seen the star behind the uh, unlit surface of the moon, so you can right. see stars passing behind it. Right. And I just wonder if you can kind of speak to the quality or the nature of the moon um, based on that kind of observation. The moon is probably, it is no doubt, the most unusual thing in the sky. And I don't mean that, you know, for astronomers out there, it's, yeah, it's pretty unusual. No, I mean, it's really freaky. Between, is it 2D or is it 3D? And one thing, a few things we know for sure. One, of course, the coincidences, uh, the fact that it can fit in front of the sun perfectly because it's 400 times less in diameter and 400 times further or closer than the sun, which is really weird. The second part is, of course, that the moon is completely locked in in one visual position. So we always see the same side of the moon, and that isn't uh, hyperbole. You literally see the exact same side of the moon. It doesn't even change a quarter of a degree in 10 years. It's always that same one. And of course, the third one, which I love so much, is the moon temperature, which is, you guys can test this yourself. Um, you can go out and buy a, a point and click uh, infrared thermometer, thermometer at, I don't know, whatever place that sells it here. And for like 15, 17 dollars, I'm not gonna do the conversion. And then, you know, shoot, shoot moonlight and shoot moon shade and, and show it yourself. What you're talking about though, as far as the, you know, is, are the stars shining through it? I don't know. I mean, some people have shown me pictures that, yeah, it kind of looks like that. I'm, I'm almost beginning to believe it's not, it's more two-dimensional than it is three-dimensional. It's still emitting some sort of its own light. I know that. I know it's self-illuminated, at the very least. Thank you. Yes, you. Hi, I'm Nick from Edmonton. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, uh, what, what is your perspective on, like, it's 1 p.m. in the day and I can see the moon and the sun in the sky. Uh -huh. um, shouldn't it be over, like, another part of the world? Yeah, yeah, it, the, the problem, you know, I, I love the question, and I get this question probably every week. Uh, the problem with using it as a uh, slam dunk, uh, convincing 100%, to put it in a specific Eastern frame, you know, that the Earth is flat, is that most people aren't three-dimensional thinkers. So, yeah, you can point at the moon. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Whatever you want to throw at your friends to use, you know, say, oh, yeah, by the way, the Earth is flat because of this. That's fine if they believe it, but most people don't have the, the grasp on where the sun and the moon should be. Uh, same thing, uh, I have to bring this up real quick, which is the uh, Foucault pendulum experiment, which every once in a while I'll bring it up. I say, people, Foucault should give us a lot more problems in the community. The reason it doesn't is because even mainstream science has a hard time explaining how it should work. And so when, when a scientist goes on about how the Foucault thing should work, they can't even explain it in less than five minutes because it, it screws with people's heads, so, okay. Uh, yes, you. Hello, my name is Connie, I'm from Red Deer. I'm just Hi. learning about these things. If I could put two quick questions out there. Sure. Number one, uh, if the Earth is flat, what about all the other planets and stars and moons, are they also flat? And number two, okay. my understanding of the flat Earth map, as opposed to the globe, is that the it oh, opens so at the bottom and and the southern perimeter is where you really see the bigger distances okay. occurring, okay. Uh, if I'm right. And have we ever tried to fly a plane, say, from the southern tip of South America to Australia to prove that it would be so much farther on a flat Earth map than on a globe where those two uh, points would be very close together? Okay. First question, first question first, let's get the obvious one out of the way, which is, and we've all heard it and you're gonna hear it more, which is, if all the planets look like spheres, doesn't that mean we're a sphere? Uh, some, the, the, easy, the easy version on that is the pool table explanation, and that is because you, you know, 
the pool tables are on the ball, they're all spheres, but the pool table isn't a sphere, you know, even though that's where all the, all, everything's happening. I don't like that one as much. Uh, the one I really like is just throwing it back at him and saying, who, who told you all those things up in the sky were spheres? NASA? The same guys that told you the Americans went to the moon? Those guys? Because that, you know, don't, and no offense, because I know there's some Americans in here, don't believe anything the United States government tells you ever about anything, especially NASA. No, 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 never do it. I mean, they're lights in the sky. That's, that's it. And if you, wanna, you want visual examples of that, uh, just go to, you know, look up any amateur astronomer photograph of one of those planets you're talking about, Jupiter, Mars, Neptune, Venus, whatever, and then compare it to what NASA shows you. Uh, it's amazing the, 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 what, what they can show you. The rings of Saturn look incredibly crisp, and there, yet there's a hexagon on top of it, and Jupiter looks amazing, even though the, that red dot on it, they, they've released duplicate pictures of, the, of Jupiter's spot, uh, even though they're, what, five years apart? Literally duplicate pictures. Um, the, second, the second question, which is the distances. We know, by, and uh, that's a, a good question, uh, and I don't have the AE map in front of me, but you guys all know what it looks like. We know there are problems with the AE map when it comes to perspective. When I made the clues, my initial thing was to point out the route, not necessarily the distances, which was on a flat map, the route makes way, way more sense, which is how I got into it. Because, I, again, I was watching a German video back in 2014 where the guy said, and he wasn't even, I mean, yeah, he was into flat earth, but he wasn't hard, hardcore. And he said, the, fl the, the routes don't make any sense on a globe. And I, again, challenge you guys to put this you know, to the test. Find me, find me a slice in the southern hemisphere that don't have connections, and all those connections are just going all over the place. To your point, though, are there problems with the distances? Yeah. Yeah, of course there are. But I ha when, and people say, well, okay, why do you keep using the AE map? I keep using it because it's a fantastic introduction into flat earth. That's why when, if, if Flat Earth is university, which what's, what's the catchphrase, uh, you'll lose sleep, you'll lose friends, but you'll gain understanding. Enroll today. Uh, that's, that's pretty much what it is. But Flat Earth is a university where you come in, the you know, once you get through the front door, there, it's wide open behind you. So advanced maps, that's what everybody's been working on for the last, oh, 18 months, two years. If you're in Flat Earth more than six months, you're probably looking at the AE map going, okay, I think it should be tweaked here and there, but it's not easy to do. Remember, it's three-dimensional thinking, and you've got to manipulate the continents around, and the last guy that tried to do it with any, he, I think he drove himself mad doing it, was uh, Tiger Dan. You know that story. I, I, I won't go into it right now, but he was a, a British guy who, who looked at it and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo the map based on distances between cities and use a 3D CAD program to stretch the continents in a certain way, and after two weeks, he, something happened to him, and we never heard from him again. That was two years ago. So, there you go. Uh, do you have any, yes. Hi, Mark, my name is Stephen from Hi. Evanston. Um, just a, I guess I can always a question, like, you know, that I have. Um, yeah. Why would the science community, like, you know, try and, uh, um, you know, keep the veil over everybody? Like, you know, why not just come clean? Is this something, like, you know, going back to the 60s and trying to beat the Russians to the moon and, you know, it's all to do, like, you know, with who got there first? And, right. you know, like, why can't they just come clean and say, look, you know, this is the way it is? It, because by the time they figured it out, our, I can only speak for the States. I don't know what was up to in Canada in 1960. But the, the industrialized world was already, the, the cement was already cast. And so men in power, it's one of the things I learned early on, which was they do not take chances. So three things would happen. Let's say, for example, some scientist revealed it tomorrow on CNN or, or whatever, and it was broadcast around that the Earth was, was not that shape. There's potential for some real shockwaves, some real upheaval. So first thing would happen is three. I'll do them real quick. Uh, the first one is academics. Literally every university in every country you, astrophysics and astronomy would have to be shut down overnight. Those would not reopen. And the remaining sciences, uh, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, take your pick. Those would have to be retooled from the ground up. Second thing would happen would be economics. You know that economics, the, the, the world markets change really, really, really quickly and on, based on almost nothing. And in this case, uh, the, um, the economic world markets would have to be suspended for a couple of months because how does it react? You know, how would the world react to this? There would, industries would rise and fall based on this. 
communities, cities, churches, which leads me to the third thing. The third thing, of course, is the biggest of all, which is spirituality. How does the general public react when all of a sudden you have all these, you know, the, the major five religions, right? Um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, they're all told the same thing, that we're created, we're part of a created world, and that intelligent design appears to be real, you know, and science, which has been beating us over the head with textbooks for the last 500 years, oh yeah, you've got a few other things you've got to explain, like, oh, evolution, the Big Bang Theory, and stuff like that. What, what happened? You, you combine those three things, this is the shortest sinister meeting of all time, which is, uh, yeah, well, what, well, what could go possibly go wrong? And then they rattle off those things right there. Oh, no, they, they'd be, no, no, we're going to keep this going for as long as they can. Unfortunately, technology caught up with them, which was the Internet, digital photography. Uh, those are the two big ones the, in social media. Uh, you combine those, and, you, again, you can't hide something like this forever, which is why this is happening, why this conference is happening, why other conferences, why there have been, oh, geez, how many meetups, 200 and something meetups, already. Uh, I've phoned in stuff to, to New Zealand, the Indonesian. It's, it's all over the place. And the reason is because they can't hide it forever. It's kind of like hiding um, cigarettes from your roommate. You can move it around here and there, but you're not going to be able to hide it forever. Sooner or later, you're going to stumble across it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark, we have a special guest here. Uh, Roland Reddy has showed up just Roland for you. And he wants to ask you a question. Oh. Roland? Take all right. Away. I'm a little nervous. Uh, Mark Sargent, Rolling Ready, Redneck Rocket Scientist, most time from Indiana, sometimes other places. Uh, quick question for you. I've been challenged on a triple dog dare to come here and ask you a few questions, but I think I'm outnumbered at this point in time. Uh, there are people from the media out there that I probably need to talk to them as well, uh, but I just wanted to ask if you had about 10 minutes after this was done, if you could talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I, I will, under the condition that uh, you are uh, kind and open-minded. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll take that as a, a maybe. Uh, one other question. We got. If, I, if I'm going to take a, a rocket up into space to blow myself up in right. a stunt with a car attached to it, right. uh, what's the most flammable substance in space? <laughs> the most flammable? That's a trick question because there are no flammable su substances in space. That's exactly what Neil deGrasse Tyson said. Yeah. So you got to take a tank of oxygen with you? He well, said that. Yeah, you'd have you'd have to combust it in its own chamber. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. I, I started thinking about this, and yeah. Neil said you can't have a, a small explosion in space, right? No. Then how can you have a big bang? <laughs> uh, that's good. Well done. Why are y'all clapping? I'm actually asking. Okay. Okay. I'll see you after this. Okay, I'll see you after this. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. Over there. Hi, my name is Eddie. Hi. I'm uh, from okay. Boise, Idaho, and I also live here in the beautiful city of Edmonton. Cool. Uh, pleasure to be here and see everyone. I got to chat with uh, just with this pretty woman here. That's uh, uh, I have a question, yeah. and uh, also now a little bit of a comment too. Close to the mic. Close to the mic. Okay. Uh, considering the moon, you know, uh, like Crow Triple Seven, how uh, it seems as though it, it seems like it could be a projection and everything. Yeah. It seems to me as as though uh, the moon, uh, being for the temperature observations that they're opposite to the sun, it almost seems like it's a uh, like a collector or almost uh, it seems like equatorially, you know, if. Uh, if the sun is orbiting the way it is, if it wasn't for something that could absorb the heat, yeah. uh, then it's almost like a capacitor or a collector. But anyway, that was my okay. comment based on earlier. But my question to you is, um, yeah. um, what's your take on the, um, the documentary that I've seen a few months ago um, concerning all the different laser tests, uh, microwave uh, you know, uh, tests all around? You know. Was that the, the one that was done in South America? It, Yes, the convex or Yeah, yeah, yeah. The it seems like uh, that, that documentary was, uh, I enjoyed it. And then I, you know, with the, with the exception of a few little details there that didn't really match up to what I was uh, used to believing and everything, it seems like it was a very, 
the first time. Apparently after I came back and, and, and listened to you guys on the channel speaking about it, I, I knew something was awry. I wasn't exactly sure the particular details concerning that, but it seemed like, uh, for the most part, it, it seemed like pretty sound sci science. The, anyway. the first hour, they're talking, he's talking about a documentary that, it, it, is it officially called The Convex Earth? I saw it. Uh, that's Convex. what uh, Patricia yeah, it was, was saying. It was done in, done in South America, and it was done by a group that we hadn't really heard about. They just came out and, and released this, this thing. The first hour I really enjoyed because yeah. they, they kind of made it as kind of like a four man, um, uh, kind of like an ancient alien format, which was, you know, the, the editing was good, the, the, the early experiments were good. By the time they got to the second hour with that teaser, you know, with the high altitude thing that was supposedly looking out over, you know, mythical continents, it got a little iffy. And then, of course, that was the, the whole alien thing that kind of threw them. Uh, if they really wanted to make this thing more serious, they probably should have removed any of uh, aliens that speak Portuguese in a high-pitched <laughs> voice that are hiding in the bushes. That, that wasn't as, as good. But I loved the first hour. I really, really did. Um, because, you know, any, any exposure, because I love that they were going down. By the way, also that they said they were in the flat earth for seven years. No, I don't think so. Not really. I think they were just kind of jumping on the bandwagon. But I, I enjoyed it. And it gave, it gave the, the community something to chew on for a while. And then after a while, we said, ah, it doesn't taste very good. So we just kind of let, let them do their own thing. Do you believe those experience, experiments could be valid or fictitious? Uh, some or of the experiments, sure. I, I love the long-distance photography stuff. Yeah. But by the time they had done their thing, remember, we already had Epi Core doing their uh, world record laser test over in Hungary. And they, they did a bang-up job. I, I lo I, again, love the technique. And if, if, if that the first hour of that video, which I think I mirrored for a little, a little while anyway, if the first hour of that video inspired other people to look into flat earth, great. Which is, by the way, you, you see me ever endorsing, you know, people that, you know, major networks that, that make a uh, flat earth video. If it generates millions and millions of hits and it's still kind of negative against flat earth, there's still going to be people that sign on because of it. It might be a smaller percentage, but it, it works. Anyway, does that right. help? Yep. Thanks, Mark. Okay, cool. Uh, let's pick up. Hey, good day. Hello. Uh, Rob Scott from over in Windsor, Ontario. Yeah. Um, so a couple questions. Really quick, you said something about projections. Yep. Uh, so do you think that this is a projection? Is that, was, uh, that was just one part that I missed. Do, I, do I think, are we, are we talking, are we talking simulated reality or are we just talking Was that about something that you are signed up for? Like that's. I'm, so, I'm signed up for the projection just because it's what we do. Life imitates li life and life yeah. art imitates life. It's what we do in planetariums. Uh, and planetariums have been around, oh boy, since the late 60s, early 70s. And people don't know how flexible those things are with the limited technology. Uh, back in the States, the planetariums would, would shut down the star projections on weekends and light everything up with lasers and do laser Floyd and laser Led Zeppelin and people get really high and lay on their backs. But the point was is you could put anything up on the sky, on, up in the ceiling that you wanted to. Or a blue beam, yeah. So, um, so with uh, my... my Original question that I actually want to get to, not okay. to make everyone paranoid or anything like that, but with, with you kind of ruffling the beast's feathers and the system that is been put in place in that sort of way, what sort of lashbacks have you received? And um, yeah, not to almost, it, and I'm not speaking just for me, the community as a whole has been treated kind of like with kid gloves. And, I, and I've mentioned this on several different things where we seem to be getting token resistance. And that is a little weird. That people, you know, I, yeah, of course, I got that one death threat from that guy over in England that said he was going to stab me with a 24 centimeter knife, and I had to do the conversion. It kind of took all the, the, the thrill out of it. It's like, what is it? It's like, it's like nine, I think it's nine inches. And then, and then I made the mistake, I don't want to get into it. That was the only one that was really bad. By the way, he wasn't on crack. He actually wrote back to, to, to clarify that he was actually on a four-day four meth bender. So it's like, okay, is that, that is exactly the story I was asking for. Yeah, thanks. But, <laughs> but, but most of the community has, I mean, like, for example, a real quick example would be uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson when he went on Comedy Central and he was going against rapper B.O.B. He could have brought his A-game and brought graphics and animations and all sorts of simple, simple things, and he didn't. He didn't bring any of that stuff. He just talked for seven minutes and brought up math. That, and he lost the, you know, despite what the audience was doing, you know, they, they, did, they weren't following along. We haven't really seen any organized, the only, okay, get back to this real quick. The only organized uh, resistance we've had from the community of science 
came from National Geographic, and that should be released in the next, what is it, August, at the end of next month. And that was because of another scientific research group over in England, the U.gov survey that you guys can look up. It was a, a British group that, that surveyed a bunch of Americans. National Geographic watched that, and when they finally came down to talk to us, they were, they were asking the questions that, that we were, I was expecting a year ago, at least, where they were saying, isn't flat earth a threat to science? What happens to medicine? What happens to space technology? What happens to civilization as we know it? It's like, really? These are the questions you're throwing at me? Like, like it was an inevitable thing. But, sorry, short answer, the, we've almost, we received almost no, uh, no organized defense. Hey, I'm Luke here from Sherwood Park. Yep. Uh, over the last couple months, you, if you watch any kind of small tidbits of news on your Facebook feed or YouTube, you'll notice that they're starting to push what uh, the Pentagon is releasing and the, mil and the government of the United States is releasing on aliens actually being true. Right. Why do you think in the recent past, like last six, seven months, there's been such a strong push by the government and the media to start releasing um, hidden Pentagon papers and stuff that like that to prove aliens? And that's a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it, the question is why 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 is, is the government bringing out uh, up 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 other things? And I've stated since the beginning that flat Earth is not the end of this story. We seem to be the framework for a canvas that hasn't been laid out yet. And, w and that's part of what I do every day. I just keep thinking and thinking of okay, what are you doing? I keep watching a, a ton of media. Uh, but yes, what, what could, if, if, because people say, okay, well, what's better, bigger than flat earth? Not much. Two things could be big, bigger than flat earth. One would be, uh, the admission, uh, the actual full blown admission of an advanced civilization bigger than ourselves, which is also could lead into intelligent design. And the other thing would be why we are here. And yeah, yeah. So every story you see that's coming out and there have been more and more every month, it's mo it's mostly because of us. Because flat Earth, remember, it's the open, ultimate open-minded test. If you can get your head around flat Earth, you shouldn't be able to shoot down any conspiracy. You should, you know, remember that I've told people that, that you know, beforehand they say, well, hey, you know, I knew a guy that uh, swears that Elvis had Bigfoot's baby. Beforehand, I'd be, get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. Now I'll give him a couple minutes. Like, okay. <laughs> we ain't got, because how, how can I not? It's hypocritical for me to, to say that. Look, I open up my day with a big bowl of flat earth. I'm not, I don't have a right to judge anyone when it comes to conspiracy. I don't care what it is. So, yeah, I think, I think it's just going to get the stories you're talking about are going to get bigger and bigger. And I'm crossing my fingers there'll be some big reveal. Uh, so wait for it because it's got to be for the masses. So whatever big reveal, because you guys are a very intelligent group of people, but the big reveal has got to be for the man on the street. And so it will be ham-fisted, whatever it is, and come over all the phones at the same time, which is also why they waited until that was over. Yes? Ernie Johnson from Calgary. Yeah. I believe a KNOW know that perspective is missing in Christendom and this latest, most profound topic of flat earth. My question really has to do with you explaining one of my favorite introductions is to how do you explain the so-called six, uh, the 1,000 plus mile spinning, the 66,600 and get that number, uh, spinning around the sun, the half million spinning around the universe, galaxy, and the galaxy spinning half a billion. Would you mind just oh, elaborating and sharing on that with people that may not know? Oh, sure, Thanks. sure, sure. Um, it, for anyone that, that doesn't know, and it, it is a, a great thing to show people, uh, or at least tell them about, and that is, if you believe, and I don't have my little globe with me right now, but we'll pretend it's my, this is my hand is a globe. Uh, we are spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, right? Spinning around the equator at 1,000 miles an hour. We're also supposedly going around the sun at about 60 times that speed, 60,000 miles an hour. But the one that blows me away is the third thing of speed. So we're spinning, we're going around something, but the entire solar system is flying sideways, supposedly like a giant Frisbee. You know, with the sun in the mi middle, like a shotgun pattern. If you remember, um, you know, you shoot shotguns, you know, all the pellets going together at once. And that just blows me away because you're talking about at, at half a million miles an hour. That's a, a ridiculous amount of speed. And why it's, it's so significant is that if you send a space probe, if, again, if you believe in, in space, 
you have these gaps, like, uh, like they're called null points between the, 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 the Earth and the Moon, where there's no gravity, it's an equal, equal part between the Earth and the Moon. And then you have these points between like the Earth and Mars, where there's no gravitational pull really at all. So if you're sending a probe, it's like throwing a golf ball out of a car window. It, you know, the, the wind aside, you're gonna lose momentum on that golf ball, it's gone. It's gone in your rear view mirror. It's not keep, yeah, it'll keep up with a car for you know a few thousand feet, but that's it, it's gone. So when you send a space probe out in a solar system that's flying sideways, that space probe is half a million miles an hour. It is long, long gone. And yet they say, oh yeah, all these probes, we can send them to Jupiter and Pluto and all these other places. So yeah, it's, it's ridiculous and, and I love that example. Yes. Hi there, I'm Carly Robinson Hi. with City News. I uh, have a question here. It seems like you sort of danced around this with your two people have asked it now. Why hasn't anyone sought out to find the edge to prove? Why hasn't there been this? You say there's these people who uh. have this money to do it, but you've danced around the question twice now. So could you answer it now? I can, I can. The, uh, and, and anyone here that's watched my stuff will, will already tell you the answer to that. And the, the big one, in, in fact, it is the reason I continued with the clues in the first place which is the Antarctic Treaty. The, uh, the, the, un, the unbroken treaty in the history of treaties, no treaty is, is like this ever in the history of, of the world. 1959, all the relevant nations had to sign on to it, and if you become an economic power, you have to sign on to it, which says that no corporation gets to go down to Antarctica ever, ever, ever gets to, to set up there. It doesn't matter how much money and you're thinking, well, that doesn't mean anything, you know, it's environmental issues. It's like, no, 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 this treaty was made in 1959. Greenpeace wasn't founded until the early 1970s. And not only that, it, this is the part that bugs me more than anything. Because remember, the United States, I, I'm not going to say what's happening up here, uh, we're based on greed and power and money. Not, not only do uh, those corporations not get to go down there, they don't even get to talk about it. And we're talking corporations from every country. I mean, Russia needed resources after World War II. England needed resources. China, you know them, they soak up resources all, all day long. And yet, they're not, even, they're not even allowed to lobby about this. If I was, for example, the head of British Petroleum, and I, I want to go down there because we were told, because the United States went down there and did all their explorations, that there's massive resources. The whole thing is made out of money. Why can't I go to the New York Times or the London Times and run a full page ad every month saying how great it would be for Mark British Petroleum to go down there? Those stories should be running all the time. No one talks about it. It is this little out of sight, out of mind thing. And uh, in fact, the treaty's not even up for review until 2041. Look it up yourself. Anything below, what is it, the 60th, 60th latitude? You can't, you can't do anything down there. So as far as us trying to make a charge onto the ice, and yeah, I've, I've talked to other people in the fighters community. It's like, oh yeah, let's charge the ice with planes and boats. The boats, you're never getting anywhere. And planes, find me someone that's willing to, because the only other thing is, you've got to have a pilot that's willing to go off of GPS. You've got to be willing to bypass GPS. Remember, GPS was designed by the American military. Ignore everything, ignore compasses, and just fly straight. Yeah, they get too much to lose. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Colin DeLorme from Dodger, Saskatchewan. Yeah. Uh, I got well, a couple of questions, but I'll ask one. Sure. Uh, you know, government hides up a lot of secrets or whatever about how the world's circle and or their globe shape like, right. kind of hypnotized or brainwashed us as kids growing up. Yeah. Um, like, there is not really any proven evidence that actually that our world is flat or around. Like, can you give me, like, your personal theory on that like are, are they are they like specialized pictures taken like how they are say we talking, man we're talking about every, every it, picture ever really yeah like, like even when man walked on the moon like i don't believe that like i don't believe they actually shuttled for whatever like i'm curious like i'm a new flat earther and uh, i'm very curious like i got tons of questions and i do research so yeah i just wanted to know that is that just a cover-up or a hoax that the oh, government oh, oh, hides oh, Josh, forgive me. Was, are we talking about you want me to my opinion on just Earth pictures that have been taken over the last 40 years? Well, basically, since I guess since the beginning of time, pretty much, like for like as, as far back as research goes, anyway. Okay, let me let me uh, I'll try to address this one, uh, but I don't want to make it real long because we got eight minutes. Um, the the Earth picture that really really stuck out to me 
which was when I was way before I was in the flat earth. Now I didn't get into it. And I didn't even start looking at it until 2014. But in 2000, and this really jogs my memory. I mean, it was amazing that I did not see this. Um, back in 2000, the internet was up, doing its thing. There were a lot of images out there, not a lot of movies, but there were a lot of images. YouTube wasn't a thing yet. Uh, I remember I was running a Tech Support team out of Colorado, and I wanted to put iconic Earth images on all my monitors. And I wanted to get different ones. I thought it'd be kind of cool, right? And I do a search for Earth from space and uh, all, all the variations, all the Boolean strings of that. And literally, it just kept kicking back the same image, which was the Apollo 17 image. Uh, which, which we all know, it shows, uh, it's iconic, it's the most reproduced uh, image of Earth, in fact, probably image in the history of the world, which shows the bottom part of Africa and all of Antarctica, which is interesting considering it's an American space program, it, that's the picture you would release. And no matter what I did, I only saw that image. Only later did I realize that it's, it's officially called the Blue Marble Shot, that shot was milked for 43 years. And I, I, can't, I can't overstate this. 43 years is a long, long time in the tech industry, in the space industry. They use that same image just over and over again for two generations. And only when we got into this in, in 2015 did they all of a sudden release a new one, just out of the blue. They said, oh, yeah, by the way, we have a satellite. It's a million miles away. Here's the second blue marble shot. And, you, and it's absolutely confirmed. It was, it was released by the White House. It was tweeted by NASA. Scott Kelly wrote the press briefing from space. Apparently, like, what, what, you got nothing better up to do? You're, wi you're, you're actually writing the White House press briefing? So everything since then, yeah, there's been a bevy of pictures since then, and I challenge anyone to look them up. They're all composites. They're all terrible. Uh, the most famous one, and I don't want to drag this out because I want to get a couple more questions in, is the, uh, the, the blue marble shot, the fake blue marble shot that they used for the very first iPhone. If you remember, if you're old enough to remember the first iPhone, it was a picture of a globe. And they didn't, like me, they, they didn't want to use the Apollo 17 shot. They were really, really old. So they got a NASA engineer to create one from scratch in Photoshop. And he admits it, you know, on, on a radio interview. You know, the whole famous, you know, it, 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 you know, it's Photoshop, but it has to be that line. And it's, it's a great testament to what can be done. And, but, and in fact, it bugged me was, and, and I'll, I said this because I was at uh, NASA with Patricia, recently was they used that clone tool. You know, he got lazy at the end. He used the clone tool for the clouds in the bottom of that shot. And we actually saw that image. It is actually a, an official NASA image at the Houston Space Center when we went there. If you go to the, the, the giant 747 with the shuttle on top of it, that plane or that, that image is actually just sitting right there. So anyway, yes. I'm Lynn from Sandpoint, Idaho. Yeah. And my question is kind of related to the spinning flying globe uh, thing you discussed earlier. Yeah. And uh, why hasn't stationary gyroscopes been a slam dunk to the science establishment for a, a, a unmoving Earth? Why isn't that just done? Uh, oh, two, two ways I can answer that. Uh, one, it's not, it's not a slam dunk for the science side because they won't address it. You gotta remember, they wouldn't even, remember those five questions I, I rattled off earlier. They won't even address those. It is one of the most frustrating parts of Flat Earth, and that is, and I, I know people in the academic community, and if anyone finds, seriously, call me. If anyone knows somebody with a master's degree in a physical science, uh, you know, master's or higher, let me know, because it's almost impossible to get them to talk about anything, mostly because the education they got is cost so much money, and it's all about being published, and the integrity of the community, you don't want to be the scientist that walks into a flat earth room. Remember, it's not about uh, winning. You've got to win fast because if you go into a flat earth argument and you don't beat flat earth in the first 20 minutes, uh, you've got problems, uh, big problems. And so they don't, know, they, they don't know how to answer a lot of our questions. But as far as the other thing, let me, let me finish it real quick, which is the reason why it's not slam dunk to the rest of the world is because the gyroscope experiments are, again, difficult to explain to somebody. You know, it's gotta be really, really quick, usually. I mean, there's some, you know, this group here, of course, would, would get it, but the average man on the street, if I can't get, some, if I can't boil it down to them in uh, generally 90 seconds or less, it, you know, they're not gonna get it. Okay. Yes, got time for, I think, two more. Maybe. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eugene from Vancouver Island. Yeah. Um, I would like to create awareness for something that a few of us ever think about, the language barrier. Um, I'd like to point out that one of the reasons the um, flat earth and, um, you know, just the general appreciation from truth 
is not um, going mainstream is um, because most of the most of the most wonderful high quality resources that are related to flat earth are available strictly in English. Um, we have to realize that there are millions of people out there uh, for whom English is, um, is out of reach. And even though we think of our you know, world as a global community, um, you know, for me English is a second language. There are millions of people out there um, who only have access to um, videos that have been translated or um, you know, videos with captions. Um, is the community doing anything to team up with, um, you know, uh, flat earthers right. from other um, international locations to bring up high quality content to those people as well? People in Middle East, China, um, you know, the republics of the ex-Soviet Union, etc. Right. So. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. You know what? And I'm going to end it on that question. Anybody else who's standing in line, uh, just hand up, hand the cards to anybody that's still there that, that's not going to be able to ask a question. And anyone that wants cards. If there's any left, just go up and see these two guys. But I want to end on that one because it's a great flat earth unity question, which is it's something that I had forgotten up until last year, which was we're just, you know, we're, we're this is a hybrid of the American Canadian flat earth community. It is amazing the amount of people that are in this from nations all over the world. And we are trying to team up, but yeah, like you said, there is a language barrier. If you have any doubt, have some fun with it, seriously. Because I've done interviews for all sorts of stuff. My, my favorite one was, uh, was a Russian thing, which I never saw air over there. But type in flat earth into Google and say, just translate it to your favorite language, be it German or Russian or Spanish or French or whatever, and then plug that term back into Google and you will see an amazing assortment of people. I mean, like, for example, the Indonesian community is massive. Uh, the Russian community is really nice. Uh, Europe is doing uh, amazing things. Uh, Australia and New Zealand are doing great stuff. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Do, do, we, do we need to do more to team up? We're trying. Uh, I, I know the Globusters did a wonderful job you know, getting Iru from South America. I, I think that's a, a great testament. The fact that we did the FE4 thing in Hungary, and that was mostly a European team. And, you know, the, the UK conference, I know they're English, but the UK conference which happened, uh, uh, Dee Marble went to a conference in South Korea. We're everywhere. I, I cannot overstate this. We are literally everywhere. So anyway, thank you very much for everyone that asked questions. Uh, again, if there's cards left, uh, you know, just see these two. Are you, you still have cards? Does anyone want one of these cards? You yeah, don't I've have to ask questions. Just go to either Patricia on this side or I've got some mark. I got just a few in my, side, my pocket. And you guys can, can have these. Uh, but thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, some wonderful speakers. And uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you again. Oops. Forgot my water. All right. Mark Sargent, QA. Good job, man. Uh, one thing I want to address, it's, it's kind of funny, and by the way, uh, we're going to take a quick break here coming up. Matt Long's going to be coming up. I've got 20 seconds to say this before we break for a, a quick uh, stretch your legs and go out and shop or something. Um, I just want to say this. This is something coming from the media. One of the things that um, I always did was I had to worry about what I said. So if you're in the media right now, I encourage you as an individual who was there for over 20-some years, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to research. Don't be afraid to ask questions, but do it quietly. Be wise about it. But you know what you're up against. Don't lie to yourself. And don't accept the lies. Just saying that. And I'm encouraging you to do it for yourself and for others. So on that note, let's take a break. Love you guys. Enjoy. And we'll see you back here in just a little bit with Matt Long. All right, if you're uh, near the doorway, if you can start doing some hand signs to everybody to motion them back in, do it in slow motion and freak them out. Uh, just a kind of a, a funny note. Earlier when I was talking about 15 years ago, what would the old you say to you if you showed up and said, hey, you're not going to believe this, but you're going to be looking into this. Just six years ago, six years ago today, Rob Skiba got a notification on Facebook that we became friends six years ago on Facebook. And that's prior to Seed. This was just when I was searching for some other things. 
whether it be Nephilim, whether it be what's going on with Israel. A lot of this, you know, teachings that Rob was doing, I was on this search. And talk, it was humbling, very humbling. And that's why I went, before we went to the break, I said to the media, don't be afraid to research. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. You know, years ago when somebody got into journalism, they, I don't know what it's like here, but in the States when you're going to school for it, they taught you take it really serious. Then a journalist has a duty to tell the truth. Not coattail an agenda or a partisanship. And I think that's the biggest problem that we have is that there's a left wing and a right wing. And the media is either going to lean on one wing or the other. The problem is it's the same bird. It's the same bird. If you're not willing to step off that bird's back, don't be afraid to tell the truth. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Don't be afraid to break programming. Now, you may not be able to make your rent after they fire you. But would you rather live a lie and keep telling them or let the truth set you free? It's that simple. So, on that note, uh, guy that I got to meet, actually I went down to Rob's place. We were working on some seed stuff. Flew down to Texas. Actually looked at relocating to Dallas so that we could work on this more. And uh, Rob and I took a road trip down to Austin, Texas to a conference down there where I actually met Robbie Davidson for the first time. We had been friends via phone, Skype, those types of things, but there's this other guy that shows up. And he's just there to go to the conference. And this guy's been on fire since then. And I've, I've, it's been a pleasure watching him develop and grow. And I actually think he grew a couple more inches. And for those of you that know, I'm a tall guy. This guy's tall too. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Matt Long. Yeah, is this thing on? What's that? Tear it up, buddy. Matt Long, everybody. Uh, I know what you guys are thinking. What is the t-shirt guy doing up on stage right now? Um, it's funny how I was going to come up here, kind of treat you guys like um, like a doctor would, where... Maybe we'd have an appointment and have you guys sit down here and wait for me for about 35 minutes. Then I'd show up, spend about five or ten minutes with you, and evaluate uh, y'all's situations. And I don't know that there's many worse places being stuck other than a doctor's office. Um, maybe the DMV, I don't know if y'all are familiar with that here. Um, but I imagine probably the worst would be being stuck on a spinning ball flying through space in an infinite, ever-expanding universe. So, um, in all seriousness, I kind of feel like a televangelist with this thing on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the offering plate here in a little bit, and you guys just throw in there whatever you feel like. So, um, in all seriousness, uh, I actually owe all of my prowess as a t-shirt folder to Rick Hummer, who was my mentor in that department, teaching me the retail fold at last year's conference in Raleigh. And Robbie will tell you, I actually requested to do it again um, here because I just, I, I really like getting to know everyone as they were coming in and, and see all the people where they're coming from. And also, it was also kind of selfish because I figured like if I knew all of you guys by name by the time I got up here, I'd be less nervous. Um, and I have a funny feeling, even though we're all in the same room, we're all talking about the same stuff, I feel like I'm a little bit more nervous than you guys might be. I'm definitely more nervous than when I was watching other people talk. So, um, but Cameron runs a tight ship out there at registration. Um, she got onto me for, for getting Nolan's uh, VIP stuff, so man, I apologize. Uh, but I was backstage, um, kind of in that last intimate moment, deciding whether I should go pee one more time, and I made the call not to. So we're gonna we're gonna find out if that was a, a good idea or not. So, but along those lines, I just I want to give you guys some advice. Um, I know it's easier to avoid awkward situations like meeting new people, um, but I just want to invite you that while you're here, just try to relax, be yourselves, and I promise you'll meet some great folks, have some great conversations, and start to forge relationships that are deeper and more meaningful than the ones that you came here to get away from. So 
I want to thank Robbie for having me. Uh, he's been a huge supporter of mine and a great asset to our community. And I really appreciate everything that he's done. He's a tremendous professional, and that's obvious with all the conferences he puts on and anything he puts, any project he puts his name on. Um, and we're all lucky to have him standing up and, and celebrating truth. I first met Robbie. You guys got a little bit of a spoiler, thanks to Rick, who didn't know what I was going to talk about here. But I met Robbie at the Back to the Future conference uh, down in Austin, Texas, put on by John Gabrielson back there. And no offense to Robbie, but I actually went there to try and meet Rob Skiba. <laughs> Mostly so I could stand in front of him and say, you're the reason I can't sleep at night. And I've heard a couple of people in here have that, uh, have that same connection. So, Rob, thanks. Uh, but I had a great time down there. I got to meet John, Rick as well, and Robbie and I just became fast friends. And so while I really appreciate all his contributions to the community, I actually more appreciate your friendship, man. And I just, I'm humbled and honored to be in such an awesome group of speakers. So thank you. So to start, my name is Matt Long, and you've met me at a very strange time in my life. I'm from a city called Fort Worth that's in the country of Texas, in case you guys didn't know that. Um, that's where my social media name comes from, Flat Worth, because um, I'm from Fort Worth, and Flat Earth plus Fort Worth equals Flat Worth. You can find me at Flat Worth on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and I'm currently co-hosting the Flat Earth podcast with David Weiss of Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole, uh, who is another great contributor to the community, probably does more in the shadows than anybody, and I'd much rather have him on our team than the other side, so... Um, and while I'd love to connect with all of you guys on those platforms out there in the ether, I'd, I'd really just prefer you guys to come up and say hey and shake my hand and get to know you guys. So please come up if you haven't already. Tonight, actually today, what I'm not reading, okay. Uh, today I'm going to visit with you a little bit about what I believe is the, the proper mindset uh, when searching for truth in this world and why there's such an indifference of the population, specifically the Christian church, on topics like the shape of the earth. If you've watched any of my stuff, you'll know that I have a biblical worldview, and most of my content is aimed at people that claim to have the same worldview, yet cling unsubstantiated to the heliocentric model. Almost as if they created it themselves, as I know Robbie and some other guys in here can attest to. And while I won't apologize for my biblical mindset, I'll at least give you fair warning, and even if you don't share the same view as me, I hope you can at least agree that there is such thing as good and evil in this world, and that that battle is something that surpasses the importance of the shape of the earth, and also is in fact the cause of the deception. So if we can agree on at least that, I'm confident that you'll get something from this talk, which is aimed in large part inward towards myself um, and anyone else that it happens to speak to. So just encourage you to listen. I will, add, I will ask that regardless of your worldview, if you'll reserve judgment and at least save any shoe or lettuce throwing to the very end, that'll, that'll be good. So um, should I stop telling jokes? I feel like they're not translating very well across <laughs> the border. I, I, was gonna say, I thought Alberta is a Texas of Canada, right? So um, anyways, so uh, that's what a good speaker will do. He'll, he'll wait and see if you're responding to jokes. If not, he'll actually insert something where he's supposed to ask if, uh, if he's not being funny. So, all right, I'll take the hint. So, a little bit about my story. Okay, I grew up playing tennis and developed a fairly unhealthy obsession with being a professional athlete. I had a totally disillusioned mindset when it came to the importance of sports in my life. My self-worth was completely tied up and being a tennis player, and I, I lived in the emotional peaks and valleys of success and failure based solely on what happened on the court that day. Couple that with being a ball earther, trying to calculate and account for the spin of the earth on each and every shot, made for a completely unsuccessful career, zero Wimbledon titles, no gold medals, and no Hall of Fame inductions. Still love the game, though, especially now that I know we're stationary. It's way easier. So you don't have to aim towards the east anymore. I entered the business world first in the industry of construction, which is still a large part of my daily life. And I now have other businesses, mostly in the energy sector, which now fund my healthy obsession with Bible and truth. For me, the importance of the topic of Flat Earth fluctuates as I dig and discover more each day. 
And while it may not be a salvation issue for a current, for a current Christian, as I understand it right now, as the deceptions of our world grow greater and greater, I believe that people's ability to discern truth and believe the words of their Bible may become directly related to the shape of the earth, almost as if it's the key that unlocks the code. That's total admitted speculation on my part, but I believe it's grounded in some sound deduction. At the very least, research into flat earth should absolutely make someone question and begin to filter the information that they absorb every day. And while I do think the earth is flat, I would much rather my content encourage someone to think and question as opposed to ultimately accept my view of the shape of the earth. So my personal flat earth story actually begins with the time in my life when I had some atheistic leanings. It's a nice way to say it. I went to an Episcopalian school, and despite being there for five years, I only remember taking one Bible class and don't remember a thing that I learned in it. And I was actually trying to think this morning if I could even remember the teacher's name, and I couldn't. So I read some books. I thought I was smart. definitely thought I was too smart for the Bible. Um, I thought that that was something... I thought it was like God was something that weak people needed. That, that was my opinion. In fact, there's a quote. It says, it's funny how the less the Bible is read, the more it's interpreted. Well, it wasn't until about 10 years ago when I started actually reading the Bible for myself that I was actually able to change my mindset, which was previously only based on the opinions of others. And once I did start reading it, I found out that it was completely different than what I thought. And I also found out that by only reading a small amount, I already knew far more than what most people knew about what it actually said. I realized that the Bible was not just a single source of information, but over 60 sources compiled by over 40 different authors in a compilation to help us navigate this place. I started to appreciate the idea of letting the Bible interpret the Bible by watching a California pastor or listening to a California pastor by the name of Chuck Smith who I randomly caught on the radio one day, and I couldn't stop listening to because he sounded like an old hippie surfer. It didn't sound like any pastor I'd ever heard. But all he did was simply read the Bible and teach what the Bible said about the Bible. My first big realization was finding out that the Bible and evolution were mutually exclusive. You could not believe the biblical account of kinds producing after their own kinds and the Darwinian ideals of macroevolution. I also found out that the geological column and the fossil record were way better explained through the flood of Noah than by billions and billions of years of non-catastrophic processes. And when I read 2 Peter 3, where it says, In the last days, scoffers will come, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they have from the beginning. He's speaking about uniformitarianism, which is the doctrine upon which evolution is based. And so here I was reading a book that was written almost 2,000 years ago, talking about exactly what was happening today. My mind was blown, and I was hooked. That sparked a huge interest in the creation story and Genesis in general, which led me to study a lot about the Nephilim, or the giants that are mentioned in Genesis 6 and throughout the Bible, that were the offspring of angels and humans. It started to look like the history of this place was, was something closer to Lord of the Rings than Planet of the Apes, And it was also interesting, like I was intrigued by the fact that people could read the same book and come out with differing opinions on things like the Nephilim, the Trinity, the Rapture, Predestination, and now the shape of the earth. My Nephilim research led me to watch a lot of Rob Skiba's stuff, who's one of, if not the, best Nephilim researcher out there. And as you know, when you watch YouTube, sometimes you can't see the full title of the video you're about to watch. Well, one day I saw a video that said, Rob Skiba, how I got into dot, dot, dot. And it was that seemingly insignificant dot, dot, dot that changed my life. It was an interview he did on Patricia Steer's show. And I thought, oh, cool, I want to see how Skiba got into the Nephilim because he's how I got into the Nephilim. So I clicked on it, started watching it for about the first 15 minutes, and Rob talked about his Nephilim stuff and a couple other projects that he's worked on over the years. And then he said... And then I got stuck on flat freaking earth of all things. I took that in. I listened a little bit more. He talked about Canary Cry Radio. He mentioned Mark Sargent, Flat Earth Clues. And then he said he did what he should have done at the beginning, which was go see what the Bible said about it. And as soon as I did that, I was done. Because the Bible, if read literally, 
is unequivocally a flat earth book. All you have to do, I could talk about all the verses, but all you have to do is Google Hebrew cosmology and you'll see what the ancient Hebrews and all the authors of the Bible, for that matter, believed about the shape of their world. He mentioned a guy named Math Powerland. So the second video I watched was Mr. Flat Earth President himself who asked me the question, photo or painting? I started looking for podcasts, found David Weiss and Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole, and my world was changed immediately forever. Not necessarily because of any one proof, but because I believe what the Bible says, and I believe that God has endowed me and all of us, if we choose to accept it, with an ability to recognize truth. And I'll back that up here in a moment with scripture. Now, remember when we met a little bit ago and I told you I had like this unhealthy obsession with being a pro athlete? Well, about the time when I'm going through this realization, um, I had decided that since I couldn't make it as a tennis player, I was actually going to try to be a football player. And I know that sounds random, but I actually played football in high school and almost played in college, but I wanted to play Division One sports, and tennis was my best shot at that. So I – but I always regretted when I got finished with tennis not giving football a, b a bigger chance. And so – one thing I found out about myself is while I, I like physical contact a lot more than most tennis players, apparently I, don't, I like it a lot less than most football players, which made me a really good quarterback, by the way, because they, they have people like protecting them so they don't get hit. I didn't even like get my uniform dirty, you know. So, um, so I played semi-pro for a few years, and I tried out for some Canadian teams. The Eskimos was one of them. Uh, they had a tryout down in, in uh, Fort Worth, actually. So um, I tried out for them and maybe the Alouettes and whoever Saskatchewan is. I can't remember the name of the... Not not, he says they're not important, so... <laughs> nice, nice. Oh, man. All right, so anyway, so I ended up getting picked up by a professional indoor team uh, out of Abilene, Texas. Not sure if you all have ever heard of that place, but it's okay if you haven't. Not missing much. And the coolest thing was that I was going to get to actually pursue this with one of my best friends, um, and favorite wide receiver from my previous team, a guy named Kyle Biddlecombe, who does a lot of cool video and photo work and helps out with Flat Worth a lot. And if you happen to see my Vegas video, Kyle put all that together. I've without a doubt thrown more non-backyard touchdowns to Kyle, uh, the backyard records held by my younger brother. Um, but he's without a doubt the most talented receiver I've ever played with. So the day after I have my Flat Earth awakening, I'm going through a training session, and this ex-NFL guy is putting Kyle and I through all these, these drills and stuff. And I can remember sitting, or I was doing dips on bleachers or something, and looking up into like a cloudless blue sky, which we don't have uh, many of anymore. But I was looking at a cloudless blue sky thinking, man, none of this matters. I was in a, a strange state of indifference to the one thing I'd wanted my entire life, which was to be a pro athlete. But I believe God changed my heart that day and wrote something new on it. And I, one night while I was, uh, we were making the drive back from Abilene to Fort Worth, about a two-hour drive, I told Kyle, I was like, man, I've got something to tell you, and it's, it's going to freak you out, is what I told him. I feel like it took me like 20 minutes to say it. Pretty sure he thought I was going to say I was gay. Like, I, I was pretty sure. I was recently divorced. It was two dudes in a car late at night. I don't know. I am currently sharing a room with another guy, and a jacuzzi is in it. So the rule was no, you couldn't get in the jacuzzi at the same time and no staring at the other guy while you were in the jacuzzi. So those, those were the rules, Jake. <clears throat> so then I told my ex-wife, who I think probably also thought I was coming out of the closet, but probably would have been some nice closure for her, but it wasn't the case. Um, then I told a few more people, then a few more. Then essentially the world on Facebook and YouTube. And while I don't, this wasn't something I was necessarily looking for, I do feel like I was uniquely chosen to help spread God's word as it specifically relates to cosmology, slightly because of my willingness to listen and consider before speaking, but I think mostly for my willingness to just get up, stand up and look stupid so that other people can learn in the safety of their own homes, kind of use me as their shield, if it were. But I do think there are worse things to stand up and look stupid for than the veracity of God's word, so no big deal. Thanks, Mom. I got to use that joke. All right, okay. So in relation to that, the other day I was walking around a golf tournament with a buddy, and we talked about crazy stuff. RH negative blood, flat earth, tiny homes. 
And we ended up where all really interesting conversations end, the Unabomber Manifesto. And he proceeded to describe me as the most interesting man in America. Now, while I venture to humbly say I doubt he's met every man in America, he's extremely well-traveled, so I'll take the compliment. Um, but it most certainly stems from simply my willingness to tell people what I'm about and what I believe in. And it ensures that I'm only surrounded by people that support what I believe because they know what I believe. It's because I gave up what caring people th- it's because I gave up caring what people think a long time ago. And as all the, the speakers in here can attest, in this game, if you care what people think, you're vulnerable. Concern yourself with what God thinks, and you'll be blessed with an extremely interesting life. In addition to that, my cousin Jacob has taught me to pray for divine appointment, appointments throughout my day. And that's been a great adventure, too. A couple weeks ago, I was driving back from a... Well, actually, I was having some really strange stuff happen in my life through different trolls and things on the Internet. But, I mean, it was like evil spiritual warfare type stuff. I was driving back from the town called um, – I was driving back from Granbury, and I was approaching – well, as I was coming into a town called Crescent, I was actually wanting to find a good place to shoot the sunset, which if you go to my Instagram, there's a lot of really cool sunset and sunrise pics and, and videos. Um and as I'm coming in this town, which is renowned for having this train that stops traffic for uh, 30 minutes on end, I see about a half mile worth of tail lights, and I decide, man, I'm just going to turn around, go the opposite direction, and just uh, let God kind of guide me. So as I'm heading down the road, wondering if I'm going the right way, uh, I come across a street, and I look at the name, and it says Sun Chase Road, which I'm literally driving road west, chasing the sun. And I have to come to a stop because there was a coiled up rattlesnake in the path of my car. So I did what everyone does when they see a giant snake, right? I stopped and I started throwing pennies at it, see if it was alive. And I had a couple direct hits and it didn't move, so I was sure that it was dead. Still didn't go up and touch it, but I was sure it was dead. Later that night, I reached out to a few people um, regarding uh, the evil stuff that I was talking about was going on. Um, and one of them was my cousin Jacob, who uh, I told you taught me to pray for these type of appointments in my life. And um, I, t- I told him about what was going on. I didn't tell him anything about my road experience, but he, he said, like the good prayer warrior that he is, he said a really great prayer, denounced the whole thing, and then he said, all right, now let me know if you find any dead snakes in your path. And, you know, that's when the chills hit, obviously, and... I told him what had happened, but but that kind of stuff happens to me all the time. So I genuinely feel as though I'm on the right path, and I'm spreading the truth according to God's word and his will. And I tell you all that to lead into my topic on mindset and cognitive dissonance as it relates to flat earth, which I deem a large part of the nature of existence, so only slightly important, I guess. So i got a question. Who here decided to wear clothes today? Pretty much everybody. Yeah, I did too. Okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Rick said his wife made him. Um, clothes say a lot about a person, don't they? A man may wear a suit to look professional or successful. A guy like me might wear a T-shirt um, to be comfortable or appear approachable, or maybe I'm lazy. But don't ask me about women's clothes because, you know, they wear that stuff for each other, so I have no idea on that stuff. But while clothes can absolutely speak to the type of person that you are, they're not you. When I go to bed tonight, I'm going to take these clothes off, and the real me, everything that's left, is going to go to sleep. And just like, in, I guess in that same fashion, to use a pun, one day we're going to, say, we're going to take these bodies off, too. And while clothes, excuse me, and just like clothes, your body can say a lot about the things that you value or give insight into your inner person. But once again, it's not the real you. The real you that can make sounds in your head without moving your mouth. Or the you that can see places you've been without going there or even opening your eyes. So in the spirit of acknowledging that this concept is totally foreign to us, Why wouldn't we start this investigation into the nature of the world that we can't observe with the nature of the world that we can observe? Because according to my Bible, they were both created by the same person. 
And just like clothes and your body can tell people a lot about you, the creation can tell us a lot about the creator. I'm going to paraphrase these next verses, but in John 1, we see that he created all things. In Romans 1, we know that the invisible things of God, including his eternal power, can be seen through the things that were made. And because of that, we are without excuse in acknowledging him. In 2 Peter 3, Peter says how some are willingly ignorant to the fact that in the beginning, the earth was standing out of water and in water. We get further clarification in Genesis 1 when God creates the firmament to separate those very same waters, the waters above and the waters below. Then in Psalm 19, we see that while the heavens declare his glory, it's this same firmament that shows his handiwork. And this creation speaks to us day by day and shows knowledge by night, and there is no language where its voice is not heard. So if we can see in Romans how knowledge of the creation can teach us about the invisible things of God, this is also backed up in Job 38 when Job questions God. God replies, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? And then God challenges his lack of knowledge by taking him on a verbal tour of creation, starting with the question, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So is it okay to take a hard stance on this notion of flat earth, especially in the church, or enclosed cosmology or biblically enclosed cosmology, like I prefer? I believe that it is, and I believe most of you here have probably heard all the verses, but in short, almost 70 times the Bible talks about the sun, moon, and stars as moving, and not once describes the earth as moving. In fact, it says it is fixed and immovable. It says that the earth is standing on a foundation set on pillars, and that there is literal water above our heads directly beneath where God sits. And you say, Matt, well, that's, that's Old Testament stuff, man. Well, okay. Well, then I'll ask you, what did Jesus believe? Did Jesus believe in our current heliocentric model? The answer is no, he didn't. And Jesus was involved in the entire process, right? According to John 1, he was there. And the way I read John 1 is that he was integral in the whole deal. We read Matthew 24, where Jesus says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and all the stars will fall to earth. Or excuse me, fall from heaven. We learn a few things from this statement about Jesus. One... He does not believe the sun is a star because even though the stars fall, the sun is only darkened. The moon does not reflect the light of the sun. The moon gives off her own light, he says. Three, he doesn't believe that stars are billions of miles away because there's no large period of waiting for them to get here. And four, he doesn't believe that stars are millions of times the size of the earth because even though they all fall to earth, stuff actually happens after that. And again, he would know because according to John 1, he was there at creation. Unfortunately, there's an attitude in the church today that if my pastor isn't teaching it, it's not important or it's a distraction. But that just makes me think of Steve Jobs when he was starting Apple Computer, when the marketing folks were telling him that people don't want personal computers. He said, well, how do they know they don't want it if they don't even know it exists? It's my opinion that most pastors, like most people, don't realize that there's a version of the flat earth that exists where everything in our daily lives can go on as normal. Where the sun can still rise and set, where you can still leave in the west and come back in the east, and where you won't fall off the edge. The problem is that most people see videos debunking flat earth using proofs that flat earthers don't even believe in to disprove it. And most people in the congregation won't do their research because they're not being talked to by others in the congregation who think there might be a problem with what we're being taught. So the problem isn't with the pastor. He's just one person. It's with the congregation. It's with us. We have the knowledge. We have the ability. Therefore, we have the responsibility. We don't want to be like those in Romans that face the wrath of God for holding back the truth and unrighteousness. I have a buddy named Robert Forsh. A lot of you guys know him, but uh, he's known as Eternal Perspective on Facebook and YouTube. Um, And if you saw the Vice News clip from the... Uh, the Raleigh conference, he was the guy where they asked who was responsible for the deception. And he said, well, uh, Satan, and then they cut him off to make him look like a religious kook. Well, I've talked to Robert a number of times. Well, first of all, the telltale sign that you're not done finished, not finished talking is when you stick your thumb out like you're about to list like five things. So I, I did a video with him allowing him to finish his answer, and his answer is super powerful because he actually implicates himself in the deception because he homeschooled his kids. 
He said he got evolution right. He knew we didn't come from monkeys, but he taught the heliocentric model. And so Robert's question, the real question is, once you find out, in my opinion, the biblical truth, what are you going to do about it? And speaking of Satan, we really do need a good versus evil mindset to understand the motive behind the deception. To understand, like we established earlier, that through the physical revelation of God's creation, you can actually get to know the non-physical attributes of God. So, of course, the forces of evil are going to want to dilute that. And how do you dilute something? Well, you pour it into something bigger, like infinite space. And you convince people that they're merely statistical probabilities of an ever-expanding, potentially infinite universe. And how do you do that? Well, you control their minds. In George Orwell's 1984, one of the elites says to the main character, as he's addressing how they've created dual cosmology because it serves their purpose of control, he says, we control matter because we control the mind. Reality is inside the skull. And if you don't have a good versus evil mindset, did we lose me? Hold on. Can y'all hear me? Okay. If you don't have a good versus evil mindset, you're not going to understand that. If you don't have a good versus evil mindset, you're not going to see the connection to the fact that the word nasha in Hebrew can mean to lift up like a rocket to space or can mean to beguile like the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden. If you don't have a good versus evil mindset, you're not going to see the snake tongue in the NASA logo. And you're not going to get that the Hebrew word for tongue was shown can actually mean fork of flame. If you don't have a good versus evil mindset, you're not going to think it's weird that NASA was literally started by Nazis, Freemasons, and magicians. You're not going to understand Napoleon when he said that man will believe anything as long as it's not in the Bible. If you don't have a good versus evil mindset, you're certainly not going to get Max Planck when he said that a scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but that his opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. You're not going to think it's weird that when you go on trial in the United States, they make you swear on a book that tells you not to swear oaths. It says let your yes be yes and your no be no in Matthew 5. And if you don't have a good versus evil mindset, you're just going to think that seeing a snake in your path or randomly watching a Rob Skiba video is just a coincidence. So... So what's causing this state of passive indifference? Well, when it comes to the shape of the planet, we learn in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, God says that he will send a strong delusion in the last days. And it's interesting that the word planet in the King James is only used one time in 2 Kings 23, but it's actually mistranslated because the Hebrew word means constellation or sign of the zodiac. In fact, the word for earth only means sand, so, um, excuse me, land, soil, or ground, not capital E, planet Earth. The word planet simply means wandering star. And it's interesting how the word used in Thessalonians for delusion is the Greek word plane, which is the root word for planet. So the word planet as we understand it today as a place where I can get in a rocket and go land on is not used one time in the Bible. But its root word is, and it means delusion. So if God sent the delusion, why did he send it? Well, remember earlier when I said, I believe we have a God-given ability to recognize truth. Well, if we choose to accept it. In verse 10, it says that because people did not receive the love of truth, just like Rick was talking about before I came up here, because people did not receive the love of truth, for that reason, God will send a strong delusion that they may believe a lie. And it gets a lot stronger. It says that they might be damned who did not believe the truth. Now, is the shape of the earth that delusion? Maybe. If it is, we certainly see some heavy implications for not believing it. But regardless, we see a great importance attributed to this notion of truth. And if you don't have a, and excuse me, and if you do have a good versus evil mindset, you'll see that there currently is and has always been a great war against truth. In fact, postmodernists say that there is no absolute truth. But those same, people's, those same people's heads explode when you ask them if they believe that statement to be true. So if truth is so important, what's its function? Well, what did Jesus say about truth? He said that truth will set you free. Free from what, you ask? Well, free from slavery. You say, well, Matt, I'm not a slave. Okay, well, you're not wearing chains. You're not being beaten. But do you have any debt? Any debt at all? Car payment, mortgage, school loan, credit cards? 
The Bible says in Proverbs 22 that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. And would you agree that debt on houses, cars, schools, credit cards, etc. is one of, if not the leading cause for our inability to slow down, take time, read the Bible, and consider the nature of our world and evaluate truth? I would. And is it not the exhaustion caused by that slavery that leads us to want to relax by getting caught up in TV shows, movies, sports, and things that we can passively absorb as opposed to actively pursue? That includes relationships, by the way. That happened to me. Because I think you will all agree it's easier to believe a lie than it is to actively pursue and discern truth. It takes research, it takes diligence, and above all, it takes time. Time that slaves typically don't have because they're distracted working through their debts. And I'm not innocent in this, by the way. It's a fact that the days that I come home the most mentally tired are the days that I just want to sit down and watch something. You've all heard, you can't serve two masters, right? Well, you can't be a slave to money and debt and the rich and be a slave to truth. Don't get me wrong, money is an awesome servant, especially when you have it working for you. But it's a terrible master, and it has most of us distracted. I'll give you my favorite distracted story. So towards the end of college, I was helping a buddy of mine move out. And we had to grab this extremely heavy set of drawers. My friend and I started to lift it from either end while a third buddy was getting the door for us. And so as we moved out into the uh, area of the third floor where three other apartments opened out onto this this area, I get into a position where we're about to go down the stairs. And I'm in a position where I I literally cannot set this thing down. Uh, My third buddy, who's supposed to be looking out for my well-being, decides to go behind me and pull my pants and boxers down all the way to my ankles while I'm holding this thing and I can't do anything about it. Totally epic, right? I was so focused on the drawers that I was carrying, I lost focus on the drawers I was wearing. I didn't even notice a guy walking around me with the intent to pull my pants down from behind. And if that is not an illustration for what's going on, I don't know what is. We can read the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. It says, please forgive us our trespasses, right? Well, if you read in the King James, it says, please forgive us our debts. Why would we need forgiveness for our debts? Well, because they're getting in the way of our pursuit of truth. Now I agree that, that debt and credit are something that this society is based on. And if the Bible describes debt as slavery, of course this world is going to make debt, lines of credit, something seemingly, well, something easy to get and seemingly normal. And yes, the far majority of people have debt, and it ranges from a lot to a little. But let's not forget the words of Mark Twain, who said, as soon as you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Now, this is extreme, I know, but I only say it to hopefully get you thinking in a different way. Understanding that money, in the sense of dollars, doesn't exist in the same way that inches don't exist. You have to have something to measure. In that same way, like you can't go grab a few inches, you can't go grab a few dollars, okay? The actual paper dollar is only worth its ability to burn or wipe something. It's just another element of control, another way to keep us enslaved, a way for us to work for something that they can arbitrarily change the value of overnight. So it truly doesn't represent anything. My daughter's grandmother came over here from Romania to get out of communism. She said that because the the government was coming in and taking hold of all the farmlands and assets, it created a huge underground cash-based market, which – so people were taking cash, hoarding it in their mattresses to try and um, hold on to some of their their assets that they had. Well, the government caught wind of this and overnight changed the currency and said they would only honor what people had in the bank. So you had people that literally went from millionaires to poor – Overnight, The U.S. is currently doing the same thing. It's just a gradual process at a slow rate. We're like frogs in boiling water. So if the value of paper money can be changed or scrapped entirely overnight, it truly doesn't represent anything. Material value, material wealth, doesn't come in the form of paper. It comes in the form of resources and energy. And how many people here, including myself, have zero ways to produce their own resources and energy in the form of food, shelter, heat, etc.? How many people are working to change that? 
How many people think they should be? If you have $100,000 in the bank, take it out in hundreds. Pretty soon, all you're going to have is a really pretty fire or really dirty napkins that don't work very well. And that's only material, worldly wealth. But real, eternal wealth comes in the form of relationships. First and foremost, a relationship with your creator. And secondly, a relationship with all these people that are on the ride with you. A A close relationship with your creator and the others around you can teach you how to be rich as opposed to how to get rich. I heard a pastor say this the other day, and I like it, so I'm going to use it, that I personally am in the top 2% of the world when it comes to material wealth because I make over $25,000 a year, which is probably the majority of the people in this room. So if you were to take 100 people, line them up, uh, random people across the world, line them up in terms of material wealth, there would only be two people in front of me. Now, if you were to take those same 100 people and line them up in terms of real eternal wealth, Where would we fall? That's the real question. Remember, we're going to take these meat suits off one day. And my goal is to walk so closely with my creator that you can't get in front of me. You might could tie me, but you're not going to beat me. And how can I do that? Well, again, the book that I deem as truth says that I can get to know the invisible attributes of God through the study and appreciation of his creation, which literally speaks to us in every language. And if there's something or someone standing in the way of that, shouldn't that be important? Shouldn't that be worth at least discussing? God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. And that doesn't mean getting more. It might mean needing less. Because someone who isn't lacking, someone who doesn't need anything from anyone is invincible. They're powerful. They're not a slave. They're not controllable. And thus, they're not corruptible. One of my favorite lines from the movie Fight Club is, it's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. This next example is with people, but you can apply it to megachurches, Christian research organizations, scientists. But if you had one guy who owned five pizza restaurants, and you have another guy who owned five pieces of pizza, and God came down and said, I want you to give away everything and follow me down this path, who's that going to be more difficult for? And he may not ask you to give up money, by the way. He may ask you to give up your reputation and stand up and look stupid for the veracity of his word. Or maybe spend a little time reaching out and encouraging others that are. So what's the solution? Well, when I was playing tennis and having arm trouble, I had to change the way that I played. I literally had to change the way that I swung the racket because it was important enough for me to keep going, to keep improving. So I invite you to consider that if this is important enough... We need to change the way that we view things like debt, slavery, control, and most of all, the importance of truth in our lives. We've established that debt leads to slavery, and truth can set you free. That's what Jesus said. And the truth has actually set me free, because it's been that pursuit of truth that has led me to downsize my lifestyle, pursue forms of income that aren't tied to the amount of hours I work, and avoid debt at all costs. And because I don't owe anybody anything, and because I've built margin into my life, I'm not triggered by the events on the world stage. I don't swallow things just because a pastor or a politician or someone of authority says it. I make up my own mind about things. I decide who I associate with. I decide how to raise my daughter. And the system is slowly losing its hold on me. So I invite you guys to pause and reflect for about five minutes this weekend and work backwards from the lifestyle that you want to live or what you want your life to stand for. And if the things that you're pursuing personally and professionally or the people that are in your ear right now aren't leading in that direction, get rid of them. Don't be a slave forever. Not all prisoners live behind bars. It's a slow process unraveling from the system, but a worthwhile one. I invite you to jump in, start swimming, and don't save anything for the way back. If the lives that we're living aren't forcing us into deep, reliant prayer regularly, we may not be picking a big enough fight with the devil. Or as Romans describes, we may not be picking a big enough fight with those that are holding back the truth and unrighteousness. Bottom line, it's just super powerful to be willingly open with people about what you believe. Yeah, I'm a flat earther. Or yeah, I believe in biblical cosmology. 
And while some people have a household where spouses may believe two different things, and it may be taboo to teach your child about flat earth, I'll tell you this, my daughter knows what I believe, and I'm not indoctrinating her. I'm not taking advantage of her youth. She simply has a dad who's bold enough and willing to stand up and declare exactly what he thinks is true. And that's only going to have a positive influence on her, by the way, as she grows up. I don't want her to grow up to be like most people. Most people are walking around asleep. Most people are walking around like they're coming back, like they're going to get a second chance. I don't believe we get a second chance. The other day I heard this great story of an older woman in Cuba that was there spreading the truth, um, as I believe it. And she hopped on a dump truck um, and immediately knew she was in a precarious situation because there were a bunch of construction workers on there. Which dump trucks, by the way, down there, that's like their public transportation. So there were a bunch of construction workers on there. She didn't just randomly jump on a dump truck. (laughs) Um, So she got on there to go over where she was going. And she immediately knew she was in danger because it was all guys. And she was groped from behind and turned around to confront the guy. And when she turned around, she was groped again and again. And she then stood up and proclaimed her love and protection from Jesus and was able to make it out unharmed. And the director of this mission told her story to an American CEO that was so inspired that he wanted to travel down there, buy her a car, so that she didn't have to deal with that anymore. He sat down with her and asked, if I could get you anything that would exponentially help your ministry and keep you safe, what would it be? And she thought for a second and said, I could really use a flashlight. And the other night, I was in a dark room. I grabbed my phone to turn on my flashlight. But I accidentally hit the calculator, which did me absolutely no good in that moment. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that when navigating through a dark realm like this place, light and truth will help you way more than math and science will. Thanks. People say that the Bible is not a science book. Well, you're damn right it's not. Because science books were written by man in an attempt to describe the things of God. But the Bible, you have to decide who wrote that. And the only way you're going to know is if you read it and test it. It plainly tells you the what and the why. And believe me, there is immense value in learning the how but it's far less important than the why. I believe that the shape of the earth is super important, but not nearly as important as recognizing that truth is good and that there is and always will be a war against it. But you have to have a good versus evil mindset in order to recognize that. If you don't, you're just going to get lost in the dark. You need to use the light and the truth to help you find your way. And at some point, you might find that those three things are actually the same thing. Or as I say, the same person. 